The Washington Post newsroom delivers breaking events around the world as they happen. Unrivaled reporting from the journalists you've come to trust to get the facts fast and meet the challenges of today head on. Get the news that matters most with a special offer by visiting WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing unlocks instant access, bringing you the Post's award-winning coverage anytime, any place. because democracy dies in darkness. Right now, top financial regulators testify before the Senate Banking Committee on recent turmoil in the banking industry, including the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. This is a special report from The Washington Post. I'm Rhonda Colvin. The questions on senators' minds today, what caused the second largest bank failure in U.S. history? Why did warning signs go unheeded? And what needs to change to prevent this from happening again? I'm joined by opinions columnist James Homan. James, let's talk about the significance of today. Um, I noticed that the latest assessment from the FDIC is that the banking failure cost the government about $20 billion. This is a pretty remarkable hearing to have these witnesses in front of these senators at this time. Let's talk about the witnesses and what they might say today. So this was the biggest financial bank failure since the 2008 market crisis, the second biggest ever. Uh, we not only had Silicon Valley Bank, but bank fail, but also Signature Bank. Uh, and it's pretty remarkable to get these folks up to the Hill the same month that it happened. Uh, it, this was only a few weeks ago. Pretty dramatic intervention in banks that were not deemed as systemic risks to the financial system. They weren't considered too big to fail. Today we're going to hear from Martin Gruenberg, the chair of the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, and Michael Barr, who's the vice chair of the Federal Reserve in charge of the supervision of the banks, as well as a representative of the Treasury Department. And then tomorrow they'll go testify before the House Financial Services Committee to answer more questions. But there are the blame game is really underway. And uh, I think you know the right and the left have sort of fallen into their predictable lanes. Obviously, there is a lot we can learn from this. But you're going to have the, the left say this was too much deregulation. They rolled back Dodd-Frank in 2018. You're going to have the right say, no, this was mismanagement and incompetence. Uh, by bad bankers who made stupid mistakes. Uh, and then you're going to have some mix of the right and the left saying, well, no, this was poor supervision. This was really the, the Fed and the FDIC's fault, that they weren't more on top of things, that there were red flags that they sort of noticed, uh, especially at the San Francisco Federal Reserve branch, but that they didn't do anything about. So you're going to kind of see a lot of finger pointing and a lot of efforts at deflection, but also to convince people no one wants this to be called a bailout uh, you know and, and so I think like you're gonna have these officials bending over backwards to say like this isn't taxpayer money this is FDIC deposit insurance that banks are paying and of course banks end up passing that along to customers uh, when they have to pay it but that's part of this too is that that no one wants to get into this new normal where it's expected that banks are going to get bailed out every time uh, that there's any kind of problem. Elizabeth Warren, who's on this committee, is going to push really hard to raise the uh, deposit insurance cap. So different senators have their own sort of pet causes that they're going to try to connect to this broader issue. Yeah, and we'll get into the politics and the finger pointing because that's expected. It's a, it's a congressional yeah. <laughs> hearing. Uh, but let's first bring in uh, our colleague Heather Long. Uh, Heather, let's talk about what contributed to the bank failure in the first place. Uh, as James just mentioned, congressional Democrats, most of them progressives, have prepared a bill that would replace regulations removed from Dodd-Frank, like the stress test uh, that banks would have to comply with. What are we learning now about other factors that led to SVB's failure? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, there's so much focus on these stress tests of these mid-sized banks. And when we talk about a mid-sized bank, that's between 50 billion and 250 billion. And those are the ones that had the regulations rolled back in 2018 by Congress. And then in 2019, by the Federal Reserve, took similar actions to have a lighter touch, as they like to say, on the banks. Uh, those mid-sized banks. But what, what really changed there, I mean, stress test, okay, it's done once a year, it's helpful. But the big difference is the capital requirement. How much money or money-like assets does a bank have to keep so that when 
businesses and, and the depositors, people like you and I, when we go to the bank to withdraw our money, how much actual cash does that bank need to be sitting on? And that's really a, a big part of what led to this crisis at Silicon Valley Bank is they had gotten a lot of deposits during the um, pandemic as people's bank accounts surged when they weren't going out and spending a lot of money. And then um, they invested those extra cash into government bonds and the value of those government bonds really dropped in the last year as the Federal Reserve raised interest rates. And so we got in a situation where there was a massive bank run at Silicon Valley Bank and they simply didn't have enough cash on hand to pay back all those depositors, so the bank failed. Mm. Um, so that's where you really see a lot of this debate. Was the law not harsh enough? Were the regulators turning a blind eye? And you know, the answer is all of all the above. Uh, definitely played a factor here. Yeah, and kind of related to that, James, what do we know about why SVB didn't have the money to pay depositors? Yeah, Heather was just talking about that, and it, it's it's pretty remarkable. You know, if you think about a bond, the bond becomes less valuable as interest rates go up because the bond is to pay out a certain amount of interest that's less than what the interest rate is now. And so banks are sitting on $620 billion in unrealized losses. Eventually, you know, it's going to be okay because they're not realized losses you know they the but they it means that they physically don't have enough money if you show up at the bank and say i want my million dollars back uh they have to then sell those bonds to be able to give you the cash that you have in your account and you know if, if only a couple people are doing that not a big deal but when you have a bank run and everyone is all of a sudden freaking out and saying i've got to get my money out then they have to sell all these bonds and they still don't have enough money. So that was what happened here. This has led to a lot of scrutiny of other similarly positioned banks. Silicon Valley uh, is, is in a more unique position because a lot of their loans were to technology companies and the tech industry has really suffered uh, during this kind of the tightening of interest rates and kind of the end of this era of easy money. And so all these venture capital uh, funds were putting money into unprofitable tech companies. And so you also have a scenario where their loans aren't gonna get paid back because they're not able to recapitalize. So it was sort of this, this mess where they were very aggressive uh, and then didn't have the money when, when people came looking for it. Yeah, and an interesting note I learned today is that uh, California's wine industry, also a lot of wineries uh, invested in SVB, so they're feeling the impact as well. And, you know, that's a huge economy in California. Uh, totally. So there was a lot of, a lot of yeah, fallout. It was people worried they weren't going to be able to pay payroll. You know, and that was and what, the, what we're going to hear from the government witnesses today is, you know, that, look, if we didn't act immediately, if we didn't act that weekend, you know, they, they took over SVB on a Friday, they kind of basically put it in receivership they're gonna say companies wouldn't have been able to meet payroll, uh, you know, not just tech startups in Silicon Valley, but wineries. And, and I actually uh, have met a bunch of people over the last few weeks. I didn't know anyone who, I, as far as I knew, who had deposits in Silicon Valley Bank. And it turns out actually a lot of people I, uh, you know, have ended up talking to even in Washington uh, were pretty exposed. And it, it is a reminder, you know, this was one of the, I think the 16th biggest bank in the country. Right. Uh, and, uh, and it had grown so rapidly during the tech boom of the last few years. Yeah. Heather, uh, I want to get you on uh, deposit insurance. That is likely going to be a theme today. Can you break down what that is and how is that going to be central to the discussion we're going to hear today? Yeah, this is um, actually a pretty good American invention. It, it started you know, around the time of the Great Depression. And the idea, of course, was to give uh, Americans, particularly working class people, the notion and the uh, trust that in the banking system that even if a bank failed, their money would still be safe. And so over time, we've raised the limit at the moment the limit is $250,000. So you can have up to $250,000 in account. You can have multiple accounts. So for richer people, what they often do is they'll have maybe a bank account, a savings account, maybe in a savings account in another institution. They might have a money market fund account. And the government, in the case of a bank failure, like what we just saw with Silicon Valley Bank, will uh, pay back that money. So that's a pretty sweet guarantee for any of us in the United States. 
The question, of course, is what happens if for those people or businesses that have more than $250,000 in the bank? And the Silicon Valley Bank had, as James was pointing out, a lot of what are known as uninsured deposits. So to give a concrete example, the billionaire Peter Thiel uh, had $50 million sitting in this bank. So that's a lot of money that was way above that normal threshold. Similarly, a lot of tech companies like Roku had really big multi-million dollar accounts at this bank. And so the government stepped in, this is very controversial, and said, we are going to protect all those accounts. So it doesn't matter if you're Peter Thiel, if you're a billionaire, a Roku, and you're a business, we are going to back all that money. Uh, that's a pretty dramatic change. We don't usually do that in the United States. And the question going forward that you hear a lot of lawmakers from the left and the right asking is, well, are we protecting the deposits of every bank now? What about the smaller banks in my state or the regional banks in my state? And so this would take an act of Congress to protect all deposits at, of any amount. But that would be a big change. It would be a costly change. Uh, what, what seems to be getting some potential traction, and I'm really going to be listening today, is, is there a middle ground here? You know, do we raise that $250,000 limit to maybe a million dollars? Or another option is we could keep it about where it is for regular people, and then we could back transaction accounts, which are the business accounts that are used to make payroll. So that means we wouldn't be scared that somebody wouldn't get their paycheck. Um, but again, whether, whether there will be bipartisan consensus on this is a big leap. Yeah, a big leap, and, and it remains to be seen. Uh, but thank you for breaking that down for us. Um, James, let's talk about the latest with SVB. Uh, over the weekend, we found out that what was left of it was acquired uh, by First Citizens Bank, which is a, a big family-run bank out of North Carolina. Uh, and then also, today's witnesses don't include the CEO or CFO. So can you tell us, you know, an update on the, the company and, and also where their executives are? Yeah, totally. And that would have been one of the big outstanding questions if they hadn't made this announcement Sunday night into Monday. Uh, it would have been, what, what are you going to do with all these Silicon Valley bank assets? And now they've worked out this deal. As you know, First Citizens, a Raleigh-based family-run business that dates to the 1880s, another tech hub uh, in North Carolina. So the... You mentioned earlier, Rhonda, that the failure of SVB will cost the FDIC about $20 billion. And this company is going to buy $72 billion in assets that Silicon Valley Bank has uh, for basically a $16.5 billion discount. So a pretty good deal for them. And then the FDIC and this bank, for Citizens, will basically share the upside and the downside. As I mentioned, they have all these technology loans. Uh, a lot of those loans aren't going to come through. And so for Citizens wanted to know that they weren't going to be left holding the bag. And so the government has agreed to absorb some of the risk. On the other hand, if it ends up being really profitable, the government will get some of that money back as well. Now, about Silicon Valley Bank, we have not heard publicly from the CEO or the CFO uh, of the bank since its collapse. Uh, and they, um, the, so the CEO, Greg Becker, is in Hawaii. Uh, just a couple years ago, he bought a three and a half million dollar house and then tore it down and built a new, much bigger house. Uh, paparazzi have spotted him there with his wife. Uh, and he uh, and the CFO, Daniel Beck, on February 27th, so just a few days before the bank fell apart, they both sold millions of dollars worth of stock total in total. Greg Becker sold $3.5 million, and Daniel Beck, the CFO, sold $575,000 the same day. So the Justice Department and the Securities and Exchange Commission are conducting separate investigations into the collapse of the bank to look into uh, whether that was suspect, whether they had information that the bank was about to collapse as they were trying to cash out. Uh, and uh, you know, that could lead to criminal consequences if, if a case can be brought. Uh, but we haven't heard from them. They're not the ones on the hot seat. You know, the, picture, the latest picture I saw of Greg Becker, he was walking around in shorts and flip-flops on the beach. Uh, you know, so this is basically the, the federal government's job to clean up the mess. And it will be interesting to watch during this hearing how much they sort of throw this guy into the bus and say this guy was terrible. Uh, that's, that's right. The regulators are, are right. going to have to talk about someone. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to talk about the response, but also maybe point to the executives. And I know when this hearing was announced, it's uh, led by Sherrod Brown, who's senator of Ohio. 
uh, Tim Scott, uh, South Carolina Republican. He's the top Republican. Um, when they announced this hearing, they did say that this is one of several. So they are putting it out there that they are not going to be done with just this. Uh, and as you mentioned, the House will also have their time with these witnesses this week. Uh, but it does leave the door open that we might see the executives uh, of uh, Silicon Valley Bank, at least maybe a letter out to them, right. trying to bring them to the Hill. Um, we've mentioned some of the people on the committee. I know I'll probably be listening to Elizabeth Warren, who has kind of been among the most vocal on this issue. Um, anybody else you're thinking about? Well, the, the kind of the populist right, J.D. Vance, who we saw speak mm -hmm. at the railroad hearing a few weeks ago, he's on this committee. Uh, I suspect Tim Scott, who you mentioned, who wants to run for president. Uh, they don't have an interest to be seen as carrying water for Wall Street. They're going to be tough. Uh, on the government and on the banks. And so I think you could have this confluence where it's sort of the, the populist right and the populist left, Sherrod Brown, Elizabeth Warren, coming hard uh, at, at the regulators from sort of a, a perspective of, you know, not representing Wall Street, but Main Street. Yeah. And we're seeing uh, the chair there, uh, Sherrod Brown, he's seated. Um, I got to look at a few excerpts of his opening statement that we'll likely hear shortly. Um, he's he's going to say, he's really going to be talking to the American people and saying, we get why you might be upset about the government bailing this uh, these uh, banks out, uh, but he's also going to present some reasons. So it seems like they are going to both be on offense and defense of uh, the banking regulators and how they responded. Yeah, sure, Brown's up for re-election, you know, your home state mm -hmm. uh, next year. And so uh, he is someone who has run as kind of standing up to the big guy, the big powerful interests. And this is an opportunity for him to show that he's using this very powerful perch as chair of the Senate Banking Committee to do that. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to be fascinated to see how he sort of threads that needle because it's obviously his party, his administration, but, you know, how, how, aggressive, how aggressive is he? Right. And out of the witnesses, is there one that you think is really going to get the lion's share of some of the tough questions? Yeah, I think FDIC, uh, you know, and so Michael Barr, the, uh, the vice chair of the Fed for supervision, he's doing an internal review that's supposed to come back pretty soon to basically look at what went wrong, lessons learned. So I suspect he'll get asked about what have you found? And he's going to say, well, you'll get my report when it's ready. Uh, but Martin Grunberg from the FDIC, you know, what kind of uh, warning signs were missed. Why wasn't more action taken? Uh, it's also possible that Michael Barr from the Fed sort of throws the San Francisco office under the bus uh, and says the San Francisco office didn't bring these problems to our attention and that they should have. Uh, and, you know, or is he going to defend the whole institution? It's his job to oversee supervision. All right. Let's go live now to the Senate Banking Committee in Dirksen 106. In the hard work of our regulators today, most bank failures of course, never a good thing or generally not a big deal. But the quick collapses of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were no ordinary failures. In less than a day, Silicon Valley Bank customers pulled $42 billion out of the bank, fueled by venture capitalists in their social media accounts. They created the largest and fastest bank run in history. In the following days, Signature Bank lost $17 billion. Regulators, both Republicans and Democrats, came together to prevent the panic from spreading. They increased liquidity, they promoted confidence in our banking system, they protected the deposits of customers and small businesses, not notably the investors, the investments of executives and shareholders. I spent that weekend on the phone with Ohio small businesses and banks and credit unions. Ohio small business owners simply wanted to make payroll. They didn't want to see years of hard work go down the drain because of venture capitalists panic, panicking on Twitter 2,000 miles away. One woman told me she was terrified she wouldn't be able to pay her workers the next week, and I heard that story over and over. Ohio banks and credit union institutions, institutions that are sound and well capitalized, didn't want to see deposits flee their institutions for the biggest Wall Street banks. For anyone who lived through the global financial crisis, it's impossible not to think of 2008. Once again, small businesses and workers feared they would pay the price for others' bad, others bad decisions. We're left with many questions and justified anger toward bank executives and boards, toward venture capitalists, toward federal and state bank regulators, toward policymakers. The scene of the crime does not start with the regulators before us. Instead, we must look inside the bank at the bank CEOs, at the Trump era banking regulators who made it their mission, again, to give Wall Street everything it wanted. 
Monday morning quarterbacking aimed only at the actions of regulators this month is as convenient as it is misplaced, coming from those who never met a Wall Street wish list they didn't want to grant. Many who are the first to scold the regulators for their failures offer ready ears whenever bank CEOs line up at their offices complaining about out of control bank examiners. Remember some of those complaints at our hearing with Fed Chair Powell over the Fed merely reviewing capital just three days before Silicon Valley Bank failed? How soon we choose to forget. When we ask who should have known how the risks were building in these banks, we should start at the source with the executives. Silicon Valley Bank almost quadrupled in size over three years. Signature Bank more than doubled in that time. The principles here aren't complicated. Banks should be prudently managed, should be mindful of the full scope of risks they face, should diversify across companies and products. The committee must consider how these banks exploded in size in a way that was clearly unsustainable. Some explanations will focus on complicated sounding concepts like balance sheet, balance risk, and moral hazard, and stress tests, and liquidity set, or liquidity ratios. Really, though, it comes down to more basic concepts, hubris, entitlement, greed, and always, always, always with big paydays at the end at the, for the executives at the top. The CEO's own pay was tied directly to the growth of SVB. At SVB, executive bonuses were pegged to return on equity, so they took more risk by buying assets with higher yields to make higher profits. When those investments started to lose money, they didn't back down. It won't surprise anyone that Silicon Valley Bank went nearly a year without a chief risk officer. Venture capitalists fueled the bank's growth by forcing the companies they invested in and advised to keep their money at Silicon Bank. And then those same VCs turned around and sparked the bank run by telling the companies to pull their money out, creating more chaos, more panic. Signature, Signature Bank found itself in the middle of a Sam Bankman Freed's crime spree at the crypto exchange FTX. The bank let him open multiple accounts. They ignored red flag after red flag. It's all just a variation of the same theme, the same root cause of most of our economic problems. Wealthy elites do anything, anything to make a quick profit and pocket the rewards. And when their risky behavior leads to catastrophic failures, they turn to the government. They turn to the government asking for help, expecting workers and taxpayers to pay the price. And too often, workers do. Even though no taxpayer money is being used to save these depositors, I understand why Americans are angry, even disgusted at how quickly the government mobilized when a bunch of elites in California were demanding it. People have a pretty good sense of whose problems get taken more seriously than others in this town. Of course, we have to prevent systemic threats to the economy, but corporate trade deals are a systemic threat to towns like I grew up in in Mansfield, Ohio, and across the industrial Midwest. So is a Wall Street, so is a Wall Street business model that rewards short-term profits over investments and innovation in workers. And those threats are not only toler tolerated, they've been actively pushed by the same crowd that this month clamored for the government to save them. Just as there are no atheists in foxholes, it appears that when there is a bank crash, there are no libertarians in the Silicon Valley. I hope that from now on, those who have no problem with government intervention to protect their own livelihoods will think a little bit harder about what their warped version of the free market has done to workers in Ohio. It may be tempting to look at all this and say, we don't need new rules. The problem was those arrogant executives but there'll always be arrogant executives. That's exactly why we need strong rules and public servants with the courage, with the courage and guts to stand up to bank lobbyists and enforce those rules. The officials sitting before us today know that their predecessors rolled back protections like capital and liquidity standards, stress tests, brokered deposit limits, and even basic supervision. They green-lighted those banks to grow and grow and grow too big, too fast. There are important questions about deposit insurance we must consider. Whether the current amount works for everyone, including small businesses, whose real goal is to meet payroll. We expect bank executives to understand the basic principles of bank management, to know they can't grow a bank by over-concentrating business in specialized area, then pay themselves huge bonuses right up until things blow up. 
That's not being a trusted partner to your customers. It's taking advantage of them. These executives must answer for their bank's downfalls. I've called on the former CEOs of those banks, those failed banks to testify. I thank Ranking Member Scott for joining us in that effort. But they must also face real consequences for their actions. Right now, none of the executives who ran these banks into the ground are barred from taking other banking jobs. None have had their compensation clawed back. None have paid any fines. Some executives have decamped to Hawaii. Others have already gone to work for other banks. Some simply wandered off into the sunset. It will surprise no one in Ohio that these bank executives face less accountability than a cashier who miscounts the cashier's box, the cash box. That's, that's why I'll be introducing legislation to strengthen regulators' ability to impose fines and penalties, to claw back bonuses, to ban executives who cause bank failures from ever working in another bank. We need to look at bank regulators' ability to not only identify risks and problems at banks, but also be empowered to actually make the banks fix them. Today, my colleagues and I are asking GAO to follow up on a 2019 report where they highlighted communication failures and the extent to which senior bank management fully addressed identified deficiencies. I'm looking forward to hearing from our financial watchdogs today. We'll be watching them to make sure they assess the damage, hold accountable those responsible, fix what is broken. Last, I ask my colleagues to work together to make sure that our financial system is stronger after this crisis. Americans have watched the same pattern over and over and over again. A crisis occurs, some of us push, push for reforms. If we're lucky, we'll be able to seize the moment and actually pass some. But then the bank lobbyists go to work, and they are so good at their jobs. Politicians spend the ensuing years rolling back reforms right up until the next crisis. And that crisis happens because, you guessed it, we rolled back regulations in this body, enabling the regulators to roll them back even further. And we know who's the first to get help in any crisis. It's little wonder. It's little wonder that workers in Ohio and around the country don't trust banks. They don't trust their own government. It's time we proved them wrong. Ignore the corporate lobbyists and put workers and their families first. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we are here to understand just how we found ourselves in the middle of the second and third largest bank failure in the United States history. Though our questions are nowhere near answered, this is an important first step in providing transparency and accountability necessary to the American taxpayer. I'd like to thank Mr. Chairman for taking the time and working with me to try to bring the bank CEOs into this hearing. I think it's incredibly important that we hear from the folks specifically and uniquely responsible for the failure of these banks, the folks who manage them. By all accounts, this is a classic tale of negligence, and it started with the banks themselves. Without any question, that's where the buck stops. So it is imperative that we hear straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, to find out why these banks were so poorly managed and so poorly managed the risks. Unfortunately, the bank execs aren't the only managers we're missing. The Secretary of the Treasury and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve are also not here to testify. I don't mean to offend the witnesses that are here, but it is hard to believe that the Biden administration seriously is concerned about the failure that we're seeing when they themselves are shielding the top official at the Department of Treasury, the same official that briefed the president and invoked the system risk exception. Nor do we have Chairman Powell here. Instead, we have the vice chair of supervision here to use the committee as a platform to talk about the wrongs under his supervision. As the Federal Reserve has already announced, he is conducting a review to assess any supervisory failures, which is an obvious inherent conflict of interest and a classic case of the fox guarding the hen house. The Fed should focus on its mission and not the climate arena. This is a waste of time, attention, and manpower. All things that could have gone into bank supervision. Banks, like any other businesses, must manage their risk and be good stewards for their customers, but unlike other businesses, banks are highly regulated. Sometimes banks even have their regulators sitting in their banks and continually monitoring the risk and activities, as is the case with Silicon Valley Bank. 
For the last two and a half weeks, the regulators have consistently described Silicon Valley as unique and highly idiosyncratic, meaning the warning signs should have been flashing red and SVB should have stood out as what it was. Absolutely a problem child. Clear as a bill were the warning signs. In fact, reports indicate that these warning signs were already flashing. And on March 19th, the New York Times wrote that Silicon Valley's bank risky practices were on the Federal Reserve's radar for more than a year. Moreover, Silicon Valley suffered from extreme interest rate risk due to investment in long-term securities that declined in value because of soaring inflation. Of all our supervisors, the Federal Reserve should have been keenly aware of the impact interest rate hikes would have on the value of these securities, and it should have been actively working to ensure the bank it supervises were heading, hedging their bets and covering their risk accordingly. But now we know, based off your testimony, Mr. Barr, that the Fed was aware. In fact, in 2021, your supervisors found deficiencies in the bank's liquidity and its management, resulting in six supervisory findings. Later in 2022, supervisors then issued three findings related to ineffective board oversight, risk management weaknesses, and the bank's internal audit function. What were the supervisors thinking? The law and the regulations are crystal clear. The Federal Reserve can take any supervisory or enforcement action it deems necessary to address unsafe and unsound practices. Recent reports confirm what we already know. Your priorities and your work with the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank President, Mary Daly, sent centered on climate change, an issue wholly unrelated to the Federal Reserve's dual mandate and role of supervisor. Given SVB's social and climate agenda, one must ask if SVB's investments in climate cause the regulators to be a bit more permissive of its risks. If you can't stay on mission and enforce the laws as they already are on the books, how how can you ask Congress for more authority with a straight face? To that end, I hope to learn how the Federal Reserve could know about such risky practices for more than a year and fail to take definitive corrective action. By all accounts, our regulators appear to have been asleep at the wheel. In addition, I also hope to learn more from the FDIC about the role in the receivership and sale of both SVB and Signature Bank, especially on the auction and the bid process. I'm very concerned that private sector offers appear to have been submitted and yet were denied. If Silicon Valley Bank had been purchased before it failed, the panic and the shock to the market and the market's confidence we've seen over the past two and a half weeks may have been avoided. If Silicon Valley had been purchased over the weekend of March 10th, confidence in the marketplace may have sustained Signature Bank and prevented its failure. The FDIC's bid auction process has been a black hole for Congress and the American people, and we deserve answers. I know in hindsight it's 2020, but when you hear rumors that this process was delayed, because the White House doesn't like mergers in any shape, form, or fashion. It makes you wonder what actually is going on. Sometimes, when it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's just a duck. As I close on this opening statement, three things remain clear to me regarding SVB. First, the bank was rife with mismanagement. Second, there was a clear supervisory failure. Our regulators were simply asleep at the wheel. And finally, President Biden's reckless spending caused 40-year high in inflation, and the country, as well as the bank, experienced tremendous loss. 
Thank you, Ranking Member Scott. I'll introduce the three witnesses today. Martin Gruenberg was sworn in as chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Board of Directors, January of 2023. Michael Barr took office as vice chair for supervision of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve in July of 2022 for a four-year term. He serves also as a member, of course, of the Board of Governors. Nellie Liang has been the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance for the U.S. Department of Treasury since July of 2021. Uh, thanks for all of you for joining us, and uh, Mr. Grunberg, if you would begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to address the recent bank failures and the federal regulatory response. On March 10th, just over two weeks ago, Silicon Valley Banker, SVB as it's known, with $209 billion in assets at year-end 2022, was closed by the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, which appointed the FDIC as receiver. The failure of SVB following the March 8th announcement by Silvergate Bank that it would voluntarily liquidate signaled the possibility of a contagion effect on other banks. On Sunday, March 12th, just two days after the failure of SVB, another institution, Signature Bank of New York, with $110 billion in assets at year end 2022, was closed by the New York State Department of Financial Services, which also appointed the FDIC as receiver. With other institutions experiencing stress, serious concerns arose about a broader economic spillover from these failures. After careful analysis and deliberation, the boards of the FDIC and the Federal Reserve voted unanimously to recommend, and the Treasury Secretary, in consultation with the President, determined that the FDIC could use emergency systemic risk authorities under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act to fully protect all depositors in winding down SVB and Signature Bank. It's worth noting that these two institutions were allowed to fail. Shareholders lost their investment. Unsecured creditors took losses. The boards and the most senior executives were removed. The FDIC has authority to investigate and hold accountable the directors and officers of the banks for the losses they caused and for any misconduct in the management of the institutions. And the FDIC has already commenced these investigations. Further, any losses to the FDIC's deposit insurance fund as a result of uninsured deposit insurance coverage will be repaid by a special assessment on banks as required by law. The FDIC has now completed the sale of both bridge banks to acquiring institutions, New York Community Bank Corp's Flagstar Bank for Signature, and First Citizens for SVB. My written testimony today describes the events leading up to the failures of SVB and S Signature Bank and the facts and circumstances that prompted the decision to utilize the authority in the FDI Act to protect all depositors in those banks following those failures further describes the management and disposition of the bridge institutions that were established. It also discusses the FDIC's assessment of the current state of the U.S. financial system, which remains sound despite recent events. In addition, it shares some preliminary lessons learned as we look back on the immediate aftermath of this episode. In that regard, the FDIC will undertake a comprehensive review of the deposit insurance system and will release a report by May 1 that will include policy options for consideration relating to deposit insurance coverage levels, excess deposit insurance, and the implications for risk-based pricing and deposit insurance fund adequacy. In addition, the FDIC's chief risk officer will undertake a review of the FDIC supervision of Signature Bank and will also release a report by May 1. Further, the FDIC will issue in May a proposed rulemaking for the special assessment 
for public comment. The two bank failures the demonstrate the implications that banks with assets over $100 billion can have for financial stability. The prudential regulation of these institutions merits serious attention, particularly for capital, liquidity, and interest rate risk. Resolution plan requirements for these institutions also merit review, including a long-term debt requirement to facilitate orderly resolution. Recent efforts to stabilize the banking system and stem potential contagion from the failures of FSB and Signature have ensured that depositors will continue to have access to their savings, that small businesses and other employers can continue to make payrolls, and that other banks, small, medium, and large, can continue to extend credit to borrowers and serve as a source of support. The FDIC continues to monitor developments and is prepared to use all of its authorities as needed. The FDIC is committed to working cooperatively with our counterparts at the other federal regulators, as well as with policymakers in the Congress to better understand what brought these institutions to failure and what measures can be taken to prevent similar failures in the future. That concludes my statement. And I'd be glad to respond to questions. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Greenberg. Mr. Barr, you're recognized. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, other members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Federal Reserve's supervisory and regulatory oversight of Silicon Valley Bank. Our banking system is sound and resilient, with strong capital and liquidity. The Federal Reserve, working with the Treasury Department and FDIC, took decisive actions to protect the U.S. economy and to strengthen public confidence in the banking system. These actions demonstrate that we are committed to ensuring that all deposits are safe. We will continue to closely monitor conditions in the banking system and are prepared to use all of our tools for any size institution as needed to keep the system safe and sound. At the same time, the events of the last few weeks raise questions about what more can be done and what more should be done so that isolated banking problems do not undermine confidence in healthy banks and threaten the stability of the banking system as a whole. At the forefront of my mind is the importance of maintaining the strength and diversity of banks of all sizes that serve communities across the country. <laughs> SVB failed because the bank's management did not effectively manage its interest rate and liquidity risk. And the bank then suffered a devastating and unexpected run by its uninsured depositors in a period of less than 24 hours. Immediately following SVB's failure, Chair Powell and I agreed that I should oversee a review of the circumstances leading up to SVB's failure. In this review, we are looking at SVB's growth and management our supervisory engagement with the bank, and regulatory requirements that applied to the bank. The picture that has emerged thus far shows SVB had inadequate risk management and internal controls that struggled to keep pace with the growth of the bank. Supervisors began delivering supervisory warnings near the end of 2021. Our review will consider whether these supervisory warnings were sufficient and whether supervisors had sufficient tools to escalate them. We are also focusing on whether the Federal Reserve's supervision was appropriate for the rapid growth and vulnerabilities of the bank. While the Federal Reserve's framework focuses on size threshold, size is not always a good proxy for risk, particularly when a bank has a non-traditional business model. Turning to regulation, we are evaluating whether application of more stringent standards would have prompted the bank to better manage the risks that led to its failure. Staff are also assessing whether SVB would have had higher levels of capital and liquidity under those standards, and whether such higher levels of capital and liquidity could have forestalled the bank's failure or provided further resilience to the bank. We need, we need to move forward with our work to improve the resilience of the banking system including the Basel III endgame reforms, a long-term debt requirement for large banks, and enhancements to stress testing with multiple scenarios so that it captures a wider range of risk and uncovers channels for contagion like those we saw in the recent series of events. 
we must also explore changes to our liquidity rules and other reforms to improve the resilience of the financial system. In addition, recent events have shown that we must evolve our understanding of banking in light of changing technology and emerging risk. Part of the Federal Reserve's core mission is to promote the safety and soundness of the banks we supervise, as well as the stability of the financial system, to help ensure that the system supports a healthy economy for U.S. households, businesses, and communities. Deeply interrogating SVB's failure and probing its broader implications is critical to our responsibility for upholding that mission. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Barr. Ms. Liang, nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, other members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here to testify and for the opportunity to speak several times in recent days to share updates from Treasury regarding current events. The American economy relies on a healthy and diverse banking system, one that includes large, small, and mid-sized banks and provides for the financial needs of families, businesses, and local communities. Nearly three weeks ago, problems emerged at two banks with the potential for immediate and significant impacts on the broader banking system and the economy. The situation demanded a swift response. In the days that followed, the federal government took decisive actions to strengthen public confidence in the U.S. banking system and to protect the U.S. economy. On March 9th, depositors at Silicon Valley Bank withdrew $42 billion in deposits in a period of just a few hours. After concluding that significant deposit withdrawals would continue the next day, the California state regulator closed SBB and appointed the FDIC as receiver. Two days later, the New York regulator closed Signature Bank, which also had experienced a depositor run and appointed the FDIC as receiver. Treasury worked to assess the effects of these failures on the broader banking system, consulting regularly with the Federal Reserve and FDIC. On Sunday evening, recognizing the urgency of reducing uncertainty for Monday morning, Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC announced a number of actions to stem uninsured depositor runs and to prevent significant disruptions to households and businesses. First, the boards of the FDIC and the Federal Reserve recommended unanimously, and Secretary Yellen approved, after consulting with the President, two actions that would enable the FDIC to complete its resolutions of the two banks in a manner that fully protects all of their depositors. These actions ensured that businesses could continue to make payroll and the families could access their funds. Depositors were protected by the deposit insurance fund. Equity holders and bondholders were not protected. Second, the Federal Reserve created the Bank Term Funding Program, a new facility to provide term funding to all insured depository institutions eligible for primary credit at the discount window, based on their holdings of Treasury and government agency securities. This program, along with the pre-existing discount window, has helped banks meet depositor demands and bolstered liquidity in the banking system. This two-pronged targeted approach was necessary to reassure depositors at all banks and to protect the U.S. banking system and economy. These actions have helped to stabilize deposits throughout the country and provided depositors with confidence that their funds were safe. In addition to these actions, on March 16th, 11 banks deposited $30 billion into First Republic Bank. The actions of these large and mid-sized banks represent a vote of confidence in the banking system and demonstrate the importance of banks of all sizes working to keep our economy strong. Moreover, on March 20th, the deposits in certain assets of Signature Bridge Bank were acquired from the FDIC, and on March 26th, the deposits in certain assets of Silicon Valley Bridge Bank were acquired from the FDIC. We continue to closely monitor developments across the banking and financial system and to coordinate with the federal and state regulators. 
As Secretary Yellen has said, we have used important tools to act quickly to prevent contagion, and they are tools we would use again to ensure that Americans' deposits are safe. Looking forward, while we do not yet have all the details about the failures of the two banks, we know that the recent developments are different from those of the global financial crisis. Back then, many financial institutions came under stress because they held low credit quality assets. This was not at all the catalyst for recent events. Our financial system is significantly stronger than it was 15 years ago. This is in large part due to the post-crisis reforms for stronger capital and liquidity. As you know, the Federal Reserve announced a review of the failure of SVB and the FDIC a review of Signature Bank. I fully support these reviews and look forward to learning more in order to inform any regulatory and supervisory responses. We must ensure that our bank regulatory pol policies and supervision are appropriate for the risks and challenges that banks face today. Thank you to the committee for its leadership on these important issues and for inviting me here to testify. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lang. Uh, and almost every member of this committee will be here today on both sides of the aisle. Uh, make your answers uh, as brief and as quick as you possibly can. So thank you for that. Uh, in 2019, by votes of four to one and five to one, uh, now chair of the NEC, Leo Brainerd, the only dissenter in, in every one of those votes, the Fed rolled back stronger rules and was responsible for supervising Silicon Bank. Mr. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, did the Fed drop the ball because it didn't see the risk that was building? Uh, thank you, Chairman Brown, uh, for that question. Uh, f fundamentally, the bank failed because its management failed to appropriately address clear interest rate risk and clear liquidity risk. That interest rate risk and liquidity risk was cited, was highlighted by the supervisors of the firm beginning in November of 2021. The, uh, the board and, uh, and sorry, the, the Federal Reserve Bank um, uh, brought forward these uh, problems to the bank and they failed to address them in a timely way. That exposure led the firm to be highly vulnerable to a shock, and that shock came uh, on the evening of Wednesday, March 8th, when it very belatedly attempted to uh, adjust its liquidity position and uh, reported uh, losses uh, on its available for sale securities. The market reaction to that was quite negative, uh, and that eventually on Thursday sparked a depositor run. So uh, some of their practices appear to have violated the basic principles of Banking 101, concentration risk, over-reliance on uninsured deposits, inadequate liquidity, poor risk management, the list goes on. How poorly managed was, managed was this bank? Uh, supervisors had rated uh, the bank um, at a very low rating. Nor normally, we would not be describing these matters, uh, confidential matters, but given that the firm failed uh, and triggered a systemic risk uh, uh, determination, uh, I'm prepared to talk about that confidential information, that the firm was rated uh, a three in the Camel scale, which is not well managed. Uh, and at the holding company level, it was rated deficient, uh, which is also uh, clearly not well managed. Hey, thank you. Uh, Chair Gruenberg, I heard from many small businesses over that weekend who had money in SVB and were worried about making payroll in Ohio, making payroll as a result of the failure. I heard from Ohio small banks and credit unions worried about deposits uh, leaving their institutions. I know that I'm not unique. Many of my colleagues from both sides of the aisle heard those same concerns in their state. Given the unprecedented scale of the bank run, what would have been the impact on small banks and small businesses across the nation if you and other regulators had not taken action to protect depositors at SVB and Signature Bank? Uh, Senator, uh, th that was our central concern. I think the evidence suggested from the sequential failures of um, first Silicon Valley and then Signature that there was a significant risk of contagion to other institutions. And in fact, over that weekend, you know, we were seeing serious stress at other institutions. And I think that and the potential knock-on effects of that contagion is really what led 
the Federal Reserve Board and the FDIC Board unanimously to recommend to the Treasury so, so Secretary. So you're saying the actions taken were the least bad option for small businesses and banks across the nation. If you hadn't acted that way, you think there would have been a contagion? I think there would have been a contagion and I think would be in a, in a worse situation today with consequences for the uh, actors in our economic system that, that yeah, you yeah, Regulators, Republicans, Democrats, all across the board, there was agreement on, on those actions. Yes. Uh, Under Secretary Lang, do you agree with that? Senator Brown, I do agree with that. I think um, the actions that were taken have been working to stabilize deposits. Had they not been taken, the runs by uninsured depositors from many small and regional sized banks and mid sized banks would have intensified and caused serious problems for small banks, liquidity, and their ability to support small businesses. Thank you. And if you can answer this really briefly, because I don't want to go over my five minutes. Uh, Mr. Gruen, Chair Gruenberg, the FDIC announced the sale of SVB and to First Citizens Bank and Trust from Senator Tillis's North Carolina, estimated it would cost the deposit insurance fund approximately $20 billion. How's that cost covered? Oh, that uh, is required by law, and I indicated in my opening statement. Uh, the FDIC has to impose an assessment on the banking industry uh, to cover the cost of a coverage for any uninsured deposits. And I would note that the law provides the FDIC authority in implementing that assessment to consider the types of entities that benefit from any action or assistance provided. And as I also indicated in my statement, we expect to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking for public comment uh, in May to, to implement the assessment. Thank you, and I would uh, point out in your testimony and your answer, there, there are no tax dollars, nothing funded through the congressional appropriations process. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What is the future of regional banking? Sure. Uh, Oh, I think we have a strong set of um, uh, regional banks in the United States. I think it was, um, uh, and as a general matter, their liquidity has remained stable through this episode. And I think it was a good indication, frankly, that in the two failed institutions, in both of those cases, the strongest bids we received to acquire those failed institutions were from two other regional banks that had the capability and uh, strategic business interest to acquire them. So uh, it, there are a lot of cautionary lessons to be learned from the Senator. I completely agree with that. Um, and we're going to need to carefully review this episode. But as a general proposition, uh, I think the regional banks in the United States remain a, a source of strength for the system. I'd say I, I walked in on the chairman's comments about the actions that were taken the weekend of the March 9th and how, how important it was and, and the importance of making sure we get credit for, for doing something that actually I, I thought could have been avoided, frankly. I thought it could have been avoided if we had someone in the private sector make the decision to buy the bank, buy the assets. Uh, had that been done on Friday, March the 10th, I think we could have literally eliminated the fiasco that we saw over the weekend. Were there folks interested in buying Silicon Valley Bank on Friday? Senator, just to be clear, before the bank failed on an open institution basis? After. Yeah. Oh, after the failure on a closed basis. Yes. Uh, we had expressions of interest. I mean, remember, this was a very rushed process, if I, I may say. The, you know, the bank failed on Friday morning we had to, uh, the, the other institution failed over the weekend. We had to set up two bridge institutions to manage those failed yes. banks. To your point though, we had expressions of interest. We quickly set up a bidding process that we ran on Sunday. We received two bids. Uh, one wasn't valid because it had not been approved by the board of the bank. And the other, after we evaluated it, indicated that it was uh, more expensive than a liquidation of the institution would have been to the FDIC. So in effect, we did not have an acceptable bid, and uh, it was really a determination that we made to try to set up two bridge institutions uh, to manage for a short period of time these two failed banks, 
and then to organize a bidding process, an open bidding process for both institutions, which we ultimately were able to implement successfully and sell a signature bank um, um, previous weekend, two weekends ago, and then uh, to sell SVB this past weekend. Are you suggesting that the fact that the board had not approved the decision off the offer that was on the table was the primary reason why you turned down that offer? It was one of the bids. As a matter of we were required for a bank to make a valid offer for the yes. board of the bank. To approve the offer. Yeah, as a matter of That was of the primary bank. reason why you did not go for, for that, that. For one. that bid, the, the other bid did not have that issue, but the other bid was um, um, more costly than liquidation would have been. So you're suggesting that it, it, a private sector engagement would have increased the cost, not decreased the cost. At, at that point, I think in part because it takes a bit of time for, this is a substantial institution, it takes yes. some time for a bank to do appropriate due diligence to evaluate the assets and liabilities and to make a, an informed bid for the institution. And it, I think as a practical matter, that was difficult to do given the compressed time frame over that initial weekend. I think that's why we set up the bridge institutions to try to put in place quickly an orderly bidding process where any interested party could submit a bid, have an opportunity to do due diligence in order to evaluate the institution and to make an informed, an informed bid. I think we were ultimately able to do that for both of these failed institutions. I'll just say with my remaining time that I look forward to the second round of questions, but I will say without question that if we would have had a better private sector engagement with quicker action from, from the feds, I think we could have avoided the, the concept that rushed us to a decision which was a concern of contagion in part. That could have been avoided if we had had a decision made on Friday if there were private sector folks willing to make a decision. But I, I, we'll have an opportunity, hopefully, on the second round. Thank you, um, Senator Warner from Virginia. Well, oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for having this hearing. It's, it's uh, good to see all of you. Um, a couple weeks ago, when we were in a finance committee hearing, I asked Secretary Yellen that I thought it was very important that we try to get all the facts out about what happened here. I very much appreciate uh, Vice Chairman Barr, uh, you taking on this unenviable task of sorting this out. Um, because I've got real questions. Was this a regulatory and bank management failure? Or was it, a, as some on my side of the aisle have, have indicated, was it a statutory failure? If it was a statutory failure and an additional test or activity was needed, I'm all for putting it in place. But my operating premise at this point is, you know, if this had been not a $200 billion bank, but a $5 billion bank, that management's mistakes, not having a risk office or other items, and failure of basic prudential regulation should have caught this. We had two chief regulators, a state regulator, that at some point, Mr. Chairman, I hope we would get in front to, where were they? And obviously the San Francisco Fed. So I'm gonna be very interested in, in making sure we get to the bottom of this. I think some of the things you've already pointed out, Vice Chair Barr, is that the bank's business, uh, concentrating in one industry, an industry that I used to be part of, um, but the fact that there was such high concentration of counterparty risk, my understanding, 10 depositors alone had about $13 billion of, of deposits. Again, it seems to me interest rate mismanagement is banking 101, and again, even at a $5 billion bank, this should have been called out. I also think the speed, I've often cited the fact that the largest bank failure we've seen was WAMU back in the crisis. $16 billion left that bank over a 10-day period. In this case, $42 billion the equivalent of 25 cents on every deposit went out in six hours. I'm not sure at that point what regulatory structure could have prevented that. And at least from reports, it seems to me that, um, uh, and I say this as somebody who used to be in the VC industry, some of the very VCs who, who banked for a long time at SVB may have started this run 
um, and demanded all of their ancillary countries, companies all go out at once. So Vice Chairman Barr, can you take us through with a little more detail, starting Wednesday night through Friday afternoon, how this happened, how we got here, and what, you're, what you've seen so far? Uh, thank you very much, Senator. Uh, I'll, I'll start where you did, which is this is a textbook case of, of bank mismanagement. Uh, the, the risk the bank face, interest rate risk and liquidity risk, those are bread and butter uh, banking issues. The, the firm was uh, quite aware of those issues. They had been told by regulators. Uh, investors were, were talking about problems with interest rate and liquidity risk uh, publicly. And they didn't take the action necessary. They were quite vulnerable uh, to risk, uh, to shocks, and they didn't take the actions necessary to meet that. What happened on Wednesday night is they belatedly uh, attempted to, to uh, improve their liquidity position, and they did it in a way that, uh, that spooked investors, that spooked depositors, that spooked the market. Uh, nonetheless, on Thursday morning, uh, things appeared calm, according to the bank's report to supervisors. Uh, but later Thursday afternoon, uh, deposit outflows started. And by Thursday evening, uh, we learned that more than $42 billion, uh, as you had indicated, had rushed out of the bank. Um, that's an, a, an extraordinary pace and scale. Uh, Federal Reserve uh, Bank staff worked with the bank um, through the afternoon, evening, and, and overnight uh, to try and find enough collateral uh, that the Federal Reserve could continue discount window uh, lending against. Uh, on, th on Friday morning, it appeared uh, that it might be possible uh, to meet the outflow that was expected the day before. Uh, but that morning, the bank let us know that they expected the outflow to be vastly larger uh, based on client requests and what was in the queue. A total of $100 billion uh, was scheduled to go out the door that day. The bank did not have enough collateral to meet that. Uh, and therefore, they were not able to actually meet their obligations uh, to pay their depositors over the course of that day, and, and they were shut down. Uh, Senator Crapo is recognized from Idaho. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in your testimony, Mr. Barr, you indicated that you were going to be, in one of the aspects of what you're working on, you're going to be looking at whether more stringent standards are needed. And I want to follow up on Senator Warner's questions relating to this argument that has been put out there, I think, as a part of the blame-shifting game, and there's a lot of that going on right now, uh, that it was a statutory failure. Uh, that brings us to the 2018 reforms, 21, Senate Bill 2155. And I just want to read to you a couple of uh, sentences out of Senate Bill 2155 with regard to the question of whether that legislation prohibited our federal regulators, and particularly the Fed, from doing anything they needed to do with regard to applying the appropriate strict standards. And to start out with, I will read uh, what, what Senate Bill 2155 did was to stop a one-size-fits-all system and mandate, by using the, changing the word may to shall, mandate that the Federal Reserve tailor its regulations to the risk and so forth. I want to read the language. It mandates that the Federal Reserve differentiate, as it tailors, differentiate among companies on an individual basis or by category, taking into consideration their capital structure, riskiness, complexity, financial activities, including financial activities of their subsidiaries, size, and any other risk-related factors that the Board of Governors deems appropriate. And then at the conclusion of the statute, of that section of the statute, it makes it crystal clear, and this is the statutory language, nothing in subsection A shall be construed to limit the authority of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in prescribing prudential standards under this section or any other law to tailor or differentiate among companies on an individual basis or by category, taking into consideration their capital structure, riskiness, complexity, financial activities, including financial activities of their subsidiaries, size, and any other risk-related factors that the Board of Governors deems appropriate. And I could go on with multiple times that language was repeated. My question to you is, was there any statutory restriction 
faced by the Federal Board of Reserves as it issued its regulations on tailoring that would have prohibited them from applying the strictest standards they could to address the prudential needs of our banking system. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Crapo. I, I agree with you. There was uh, substantial discretion um, under that act uh, for the Federal Reserve uh, to put in place tailoring rules that were different from the tailoring rules that it put in place uh, in, in 2019. I think there is uh, still to this day a substantial discretion uh, in changing those by notice and comment rulemaking. That's one of the areas that uh, we'll be looking at in our review, whether there should be uh, appropriate uh, changes. There, there are some areas for, uh, particularly for smaller firms, firms between 50 and 100 billion, where the act is more prescriptive. Um, but for the firms of the category that we're addressing today, there's substantial discretion uh, for the Federal Reserve to change those rules in a way that is supportive of safety and soundness and financial stability. Thank you, and I appreciate your answer. Uh, you said recently that the bank failed, referring to SVB, as the public began to focus on changes in values of securities in the bank's held to maturity account. That's correct, right? Uh, my question to you there is, uh, did, did the standards on that risk that are used for supervision, uh, were those changed at all in Senate Bill 2155 in 2018? The, the standards for uh, capital rules are determined by the bank agencies. The bank agencies made a decision to, um, for uh, smaller categories of these large banks, to not require the pass-through of AOCI into the capital structure. Uh, but that was a, a decision that is um, uh, available to be uh, altered um, by the discretion of the bank agency. And was not mandated by 2155? Uh, no, it was not mandated by 2155. Uh, last question is, under the current standards that are applied with regard to capital, was uh, S VB adequately capitalized? Uh, prior to, uh, yes, prior to its failure, it was uh, categorized under current capital rules as well capitalized. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Senator Crapo. Senator Cortez Masto from Nevada is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, all three of you, for being here. Um, Vice Chairman Barr, let me, let me start with you. Uh, you've talked about how the Federal Reserve is undergoing an investigation um, uh, to determine whether the Federal Reserve actually failed in this instance. Is the Federal Reserve the appropriate body to conduct this investigation, or should we have an independent investigation? Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. It's a, a terrific question. Uh, we describe what we're doing as a review. We're reviewing our own practices. I think it's an important part of risk management to do self-assessment. I think it would be irresponsible and imprudent of us not to do self-assessment. Uh, we're going to take that very seriously. We're going to be thorough. We're going to be transparent and we're going to be far-reaching in that self-assessment. I also think it's appropriate for outsiders to have independent reviews, and we expect and welcome independent reviews of our actions. And if, the, if you uh, uncover in your investigation that the Federal Reserve failed here in some of its supervisory roles, will you make that public? Yes, we intend to make our report uh, uh, fully public uh, on May 1st, and that report will include uh, normally, it's not our practice to include, but that report will include confidential supervisory information, such as the exam reports. And in the scope of your review, you identify the scope of that review in your written testimony. Is there anything in addition that's not in your written testimony that you will be reviewing here in that uh, scope? Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. I, I've uh, asked the staff to be um, uh, uh, far-reaching. So if they determine that an issue uh, should be in scope, they have full discretion to put that issue in scope and to address it in the review. So there, there are no limitations on their ability to review how the Federal Reserve uh, conducted its supervision and the regulatory oversight of the firm. Thank you. And then one final thing, because there's been a lot of discussion about um, the previous uh, rollback of, of some of the regulation in, in votes in this body uh, just recently. If you find that that change in the law impacted the Federal Reserve's ability to uh, conduct the appropriate tests based on the tiering of the bank's assets, would you be forthcoming with that and, and say so? Yes, we, we intend to describe uh, where we think supervisory and regulatory failings occurred 
if changing those to make them what we think is the right standard would require uh, an act of Congress, we will say so in that review. And then Chairman uh, uh, Grunberg, same to you. Uh, you're conducting a scope uh, of the FDIC. Are you comfortable that you can conduct that and be transparent and accountable, or should there be an independent body looking at this? I think there's room for both. As Michael indicated, I think it's important for each of our agencies to look internally at our supervision of these institutions and uh, draw lessons from it. In our case, we've asked our chief risk officer, who's not directly involved in the supervision process and has, whose role is to evaluate risk at the FDIC uh, to undertake this internal review of our supervision of uh, Signature Bank. Thank you. And then there's been a lot of talk in the media uh, about the executive um, salaries, uh, about the executive bonuses, about the, the sale of stock. Let me ask um, the three of you, uh, my first question is, what authority do you have to claw back uh, any of those uh, bonuses or the executive pay or even deal with the, the sale of the stock? And maybe, uh, Mr. Grunberg, let's start with you and then go down. Thank you, Senator. You know, as I indicated in my um, opening statement, the FDIC for every failed institution is required to undertake an investigation of the conduct of the members of the board, the management of the institution as well as professional service providers and other uh, institution affiliated parties. We've already begun that investigation and we have significant authority under the law um, depending on the findings of the investigation uh, to impose civil money penalties, restitution, and as well bar individuals from the business of banking. So the, the authorities are uh, substantial, and we're going to uh, pursue this uh, as expeditiously as we can. I know there's interest. We, don't, we do not have, under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, explicit authority for clawback of compensation. We can get to some of that with our other authorities. We have that specific authority under Title II of the Dodd-Frank Act. If you are looking for an additional authority, specific authority under the FDI Act for clawbacks probably would have some value here. Thank you. Mr. Barr. Uh, uh, thank you. The, bo the board does have authority um, to pursue actions against individuals uh, who engage in violations of the law, uh, who engage in unsafe or unsound practices, uh, who have engaged in breaches of fiduciary duty. Uh, we retain this authority even after a bank uh, fails. Uh, and we stand ready to use this authority to the fullest extent uh, based on the facts and circumstances. And uh, as with uh, Chair Grunberg, uh, potential consequences include a prohibition from banking, civil money penalties, or the payment of restitution. We intend to use these authorities to the fullest extent we are able. Thank you. Ms. Ling, and I know I, if, yeah, brief, with the Chairman's brief, indulgence. Yeah, briefly, Ms. Ling. Yes, I defer to the FDIC and the Federal Reserve on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was brief. Thank you, Under Madam Undersecretary. Senator Rounds of South Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thank you to all of you for appearing before our committee today. Vice Chair Barr, in your testimony, you said that in November, the Fed supervisors delivered a supervisory finding on interest rate risk management to Silicon Valley Bank. As you know, the communication of supervisory findings must be focused on significant matters that require attention. Matters requiring immediate attention, or MRIAs, are matters of significant importance that the Fed believes need to be resolved right away, including matters that have the potential to pose significant risk to the safety and soundness of the banking organization. Uh, my question, uh, Vice Chair Barr, was managing interest rate risk listed in the MRIA section of the supervisory finding issued to SVB? And if it was not, why not? Um, Senator, we're, we're still uh, reconstructing the supervisory record. We've just started the review. But my understanding is that um, they were issued a matter requiring immediate attention based on the inaccuracy of their interest rate risk modeling. Um, essentially, the, the risk model was not at all aligned with reality. A pretty interesting statement if it was not aligned with reality. Um, I recognize that you're going to have a complete report, and, and I'm not going to try to push you too far into this, but 
I, I, I'm really curious, what's the time frame that's expected for a response for an MRIA, one that requires immediate uh, attention? Uh, uh, Senator, there's, there's not a, a fixed amount of time. Uh, it depends on the issue, the scope of the issue, the complexity of resolving the issue. So I don't, I don't have a way of giving you a, a firm baseline uh, on the action, but they're, they're expected to be a top priority for management to address. And particularly in the interest rate environment that we're in, and, and knowing that the firm had been cited previously for uh, other problems with liquidity risk management and interest rate risk management, uh, supervisors would expect that that would take a high priority attention uh, by top management. The, the supervisors uh, met with the CFO of the firm in the fall, um, in October of 2021, to convey the seriousness of the findings um, uh, directly. During this time period, uh, perhaps for as much as six months during that previous year, the bank was without a risk management officer, is that correct? That, that's my understanding. I, I think it's uh, terrible risk management, obviously, not to have a, 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 a CRO at the firm. You need an effective CRO as part of uh, risk management of the firm. And as I indicated previously, uh, the supervisors had told the firm uh, in the summer that they had deficiencies in governance and controls at the management level and the board level, and that was related to their failure to appropriately manage risk. My understanding is that there was a period of time there in which they were without a CFO as well. Is that correct? Uh, I don't uh, have the details uh, of that, but I'm happy to get back to you. Okay. Um, when, and I recognize that there is a difference between a matter requiring immediate attention and a matter requiring attention. Can you kind of share with us the difference? I mean, the, 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 there, there clearly is a defined difference between a matter of such importance that it requires immediate attention versus one where it requires attention. Can you talk a little bit about what the expectations are between the two? They both uh, really signal that bank management should pay attention to what's in front of them. They're not, um, they're not issued lightly. A uh, matter require immediate attention is, as its name suggested, uh, telling managers that they should place a priority on fixing this issue over other issues. Uh, but the, the, the exercise of the line between the two is a matter of supervisory judgment. Just to, to follow up a little bit, and recognizing once again that we'll get a full report in the next couple of weeks, but it seems to me that when it turns into an MRIA, there is an expectation that the board or the executive officers would respond fairly quickly. To your knowledge at this point, was that expectation met? Well, I, I, th I think the fundamental fact is, you know, the firm failed because of its interest rate risk and its liquidity risk, and that is, I think, evidence of the fact that they didn't respond strongly enough and promptly enough. In other words, with the information that you had and that the regulators had, they were able to determine that there was a problem at the bank, and they directed that there be a response uh, immediately, an immediate response, uh, based upon the data that they were able to gather at that time. That, that's a, a reasonable assumption, is it not? I, I don't know what the time frame sets out, set out in each of the individual orders were, so I'm not able to answer your question with precision, and I want to be very careful to be able to do that. That's fair. And not, not go beyond Let the record. Let me just but finish with this, though. But we will receive that information when the full report comes out. Yes. Uh, on May 1st, we'll release the full report, and it will include the reports of examination. Uh, and so people will be able to see what's in the record. Very good. Uh, thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Menendez of New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In, in 2018, Congress passed a bill which was signed into law by President Trump that relaxed re uh, regulation for institutions like Silicon Valley Bank. That law, which I opposed, uh, exempted those banks from enhanced prudential standards. Stress tests raised the threshold at which a bank would be considered syst uh, systemically important. Uh, but even as that law kept Silicon Valley Bank off the list of systemically important institutions, the Fed and the FDIC rightly cited systemic risk to justify their actions to prevent runs on other banks. So Mr. Barr, Mr. Grunberg, uh, each of you voted to invoke what is known as the, quote, systemic risk exception. So with a simple yes or no, can you tell me that the situation at Silicon Valley Bank posed systemic risk? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Senator. I, I think it's an absolutely crucial question. Uh, 
the invocation of the systemic risk uh, exception required uh, judgment as well as incoming data. And our best assessment, the assessment of a unanimous Federal Reserve Board, any unanimous board of the FDIC and, and the Treasury Secretary, was that we were seeing signs of contagion in the banking system that threatened to uh, put at risk depositors uh, and banks across the country. And to make sure that banks uh, could continue to lend in their communities, to make sure that depositors were safe, to make sure that businesses could pay payroll, well, we thought it was important to, uh, to, to invoke that systemic risk determination and, because and prevent you, that. Because you felt that Silicon Valley Bank was a systemic risk at that point in time? Uh, the, the judgment was really broadly about the risk that the failures of these institutions and other stresses in the system were posing as a whole, as opposed to well, a particular seems, decision only about... It seems to me that, about, that that sounds like a distinction without a difference. Uh, if any single bank's failure can cause contagion, uh, that threatens the system, then it seems that the, the bank should be considered systemically important. Uh, and so we need, to, you, you all need to have an obligation to be clear with us uh, and with the American people uh, when you took extraordinary steps to protect uninsured depositors that could very well lead to increased fees charged to banks and ultimately to consumers. So I think we need to be clear about what is a systemic risk. Uh, and so uh, I'm looking for a more crystallized version of that. I was here in 2008. I don't want to live through it again. Uh, do you agree with President Biden's statement two weeks ago that Congress should strengthen rules for banks to make it less likely that we will see another failure similar to that of Silicon Valley Bank? Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. I think it's important for us to, to strengthen capital and liquidity rules. Uh, we're working on strengthening them as, as part of our Basel III reforms and our holistic review of capital. And, and I think we need to, to move forward with that. And as both Chair Grun Grunberg and I suggested, uh, with a long-term debt requirement uh, that would provide an additional cushion uh, in addition to capital uh, for large institutions. That, that work uh, will need to go through notice and comment rulemaking. There will be transition periods for it. But I think that is really important work for us to do, and I'm committed to doing it. Well, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Barr. This morning, uh, I, along with Senator Rounds and other members of this committee, sent a letter to Chairman Powell asking him to explain whether the feds had applied enhanced supervision or prudential standards to Silicon Valley Bank or any similar sized bank using the feds existing authority. We've also learned from public reporting that fed supervisors began flagging problems as a SVB as far back as 2021. Now I understand we have a lot more to learn about the facts of what transpired, both at the bank with any management failures, but I expect that we're gonna see that all factored in as part of a review. So as you begin that review, let me ask you, do you agree with Chairman Powell's statement last week that from what we know, it is, quote, clear that we do need to strengthen supervision and regulation? Yes, I absolutely agree right, with that thank, statement. Thank you for that. Now, lastly, uh, what I, I would love to know, uh, Mr. Greenberg, about as we think about uh, should we raise uh, the federal deposit insurance, what percentage of account holders does that account for? How much is private versus business? Um, and uh, what are the costs that are associated with it? So I'll just put that out there for you to submit an answer to the record because it will take more time than what I have. But the last point I want to make is we have seen a flight from regional and community banks to quote unquote too big to fail banks. And a concentration of deposits at a select few institutions also brings about its own risks to the financial system. At the end of the day, it seems that we are incentivizing uh, uh, entities to go, to go to too big to fail banks. It only makes it even more consequential in terms of too big to fail. Is that what we want to ultimately achieve in this process? Uh, Senator, I, I think that the, the goal of the actions that we took uh, are to make sure that we have a thriving and uh, diverse system of banking in the United States, including community banks and regional banks that are the lifeblood of many communities all across the country. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Senator. Senator. Senator Kennedy of Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. Chairman Barr, we uh, 
the, the Federal Reserve rather stress tested 34 banks in 2022. Is that correct? Uh, Senator, I, I don't have the, the exact number in front of me, but that's well, I have your that report. Sounds, that I have your correct. report. It says 34. <laughs> and the cutoff was $100 billion. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, you didn't stress test Silicon Valley Bank, did you? No, under the Reserve, Federal Reserve Board's rules that were put in place um, for the transition into the stress testing, uh, it takes a while for a firm uh, to be considered above the threshold. Yeah. They need to have a rolling four-quarter average. Did you stress test Silicon Valley Bank in 2022? No. Okay. Uh, Silicon Va Valley Bank had uh, $100 billion, more than $100 billion in assets at the end of, of 2021, did it not? Uh, Senator, as I was explaining, the, the transition rules in place at the time right require a rolling four-quarter average to be above that amount. Okay. And then if the firm is, happens to be in a year that isn't the year that, since it's an every other year test, that a test is running, right. then it waits till the next year. So for Silicon Valley Bank, that would have meant 2024 would be okay. its first stress test. But the point is you didn't, you didn't test Silicon Valley Bank. We, we did not apply a stress test to Silicon right. Valley Bank. Right. It, it was, of course, using did, its own stress test. Did you have the, the authority to do it? Um, under our existing regulations, no. We would have to change our regulations to have that authority. Under, under the, uh, the, the, the Congress's amendment to Dodd-Frank, Senator Crapo talked about it, 2155, Section 252.3, isn't it a fact that uh, we gave the, uh, the, the uh, Federal Reserve the authority to, to, tr to stress test Silicon Valley Bank? Uh, under, under that legislation, the Federal Reserve could have put in place a rule yeah. defining the word periodic but you did. in a different way than, than was done. Right, but you didn't, did you? The Federal Reserve did not do that. Okay. Um, it, if you had stress tests, so... You, well, let me, let me put it this way. If you had stress tested Silicon Valley Bank in 2022, it wouldn't have made any difference, would it? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, you didn't test for Silicon Valley Bank's problem. I've read your report. Your, your stress test, you stress tested these 34 banks for... Uh, falling GDP, spike in unemployment, and defaults in commercial real estate. Isn't that correct? Yes. In a typical adverse scenario for banks, we're testing but, falling interest but, rate but environments. But that wasn't our problem in 2020. I, I completely agree it's with you. It's not that. our problem today. The problem yeah. is inflation, high interest rate, and loss of value in government bonds, isn't it? I completely agree with you. So you, you, you stress tested in 2022 for the wrong thing. The stress test is not the primary way that the Federal Reserve or other regulators test for interest rate risk. But you, you stress tested for the wrong thing. As, as I said, Senator, I, I agree with you that it would be useful to test for higher rising interest rates. That's why in our alternative scenario, multiple scenario that we put in place for this year's stress test, we do that. The, these decisions were made before I arrived, but I, I agree with you that it would be But it's be like somebody going in for a, 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 a test for a for COVID and getting a test for cholera, isn't it? I, I, I don't know enough about either of those tests to know. Yeah. Well, they're different. Um, so all this business about, well, the, Dodd, the amendment to Dodd-Frank kept them from stress testing. The way I see it, you, you chose not to stress test. And if you had stress test Silicon Valley Bank, you wouldn't have caught the problem. As, as I said, Senator, I agree with you that the, the statute requires periodic stress testing. The Federal Reserve made a decision about how to implement that right. in, 20, in 2019. Right. That resulted in SVB not being tested until, planned to be tested until 2024. Well, you, but as I said, you, the stress you, test you, requirements... You knew, you knew from the... I'm sorry to cut you off, but the chairman's going to cut me off in a second. But you knew... The Federal Reserve knew well in advance that Silicon Valley Bank had a problem with holding too much of, of its money 
in interest rate sensitive long government bonds, didn't you? I, I think the investing public and the Federal Reserve, which cited it um, for interest rate risk problems, knew that it had interest rate risk. I think the Federal nobody Reserve didn't anticipated do anything about problem. it, did it? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the you. The Federal Reserve didn't do anything about it, did it? I, I disagree with that, uh, Senator, respectfully. The, the, the Federal Reserve did uh, cite these problems uh, to the bank and require them to take action. Bank management failed to act on those You didn't follow citations. up, did you? Senator's time has expired. I think that I sit here and watch um, Mr. Barr uh, reluctant to criticize some of the moves of his predecessors at the Federal Reserve. I'll leave it at that. Senator Smith from Minnesota is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks to our, um, our folks for being here today. Really very much appreciate it. Um, so I want to just start by re reiterating what I know some of my colleagues have said, which was that as these two banks collapsed, I heard you say very clearly, Vice uh, Chair Barr, um, the Silicon Valley Bank in particular collapsed because of you know, what looks like gross mismanagement and failure to manage even the most basic of risks, um, liquidity and interest rate risks. The Biden administration and regulators took strong and decisive action to protect people and to keep our banking system um, safe and secure. And the reality is that that action that you took was necessary, um, but it was also extraordinary. Extra extraordinary actions were called for um, in the moment. And you, of course, don't want to have to use extraordinary actions. You want to be able to rely on um, banks to, do, uh, to make good decisions and to protect their um, shareholders and to protect their depositors. Um, but let me just clarify one thing before I want to follow up a little bit on Senator Kennedy's questions. Um, the, Fed, the Fed, under the previous um, vice chair of supervision put into place rules um, that um, I think there's a question about whether those rules, I mean, I think even in the moment, you were, you were critical of those rules. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so um, your review will, um, will take a look at what would have happened if those rules hadn't been in place, and then you can make decisions um, w about what new rules need to be in place to protect from this kind of extraordinary situation that we saw with these, new, these two banks. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Senator. So I think that's just important for us all to understand here um, as, we under <clears throat> as we think about what has happened. Um, the Silicon Valley Bank's failure was the result, it appears, of management failures at many levels, all coming together at the worst possible time. And I'm particularly struck by the bank's failure to manage interest rate risk. You and I talked about this um, last week, um, which is basic bank management. It's not rocket science to manage interest rate risks. Um, and, you know, interest rate risks, interest rates, excuse me, were near zero for more than a decade. And a lot of business models, it appears, including Silicon Valley Bank's business model, was predicated on basically free money. And um, that obviously presents risks when that changes. So I'm concerned, um, uh, Vice Chair Barr, about other institutions, banks and non-banks alike, um, how they are managing what must be similar interest rate risks. Could you just address that um, and talk about how the Fed right now and others are monitoring that interest rate risk um, and what that tells you about what we need to do differently? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, you know, let me just start with the basic point, which is the, the banking system is, is sound and resilient. Uh, mo most banks are highly effective in managing interest rate risk and liquidity risk. It is the bread and butter uh, kind of work uh, of bank management. Uh, so we, we are monitoring uh, the financial system, monitoring the banking system. Uh, we're looking at interest rate risk and liquidity risk across the banking system to assess that. Uh, where banks need to do better at interest rate risk and, and liquidity risk management, uh, we're pointing that out. But I think the, f the fundamental point is the banking system is sound and resilient. I might have mentioned to you when we spoke that I had a chance to meet with a group of Minnesota bankers, mm -hmm. um, including uh, Minnesota has more community bankers, I think, per capita than any state in the country. And they were eager to point out to me that their business models are very different. Mm -hmm from the business models of highly risky enterprises like Silicon Valley Bank. And so I appreciate you, um, you raising that. In fact, I've been getting texts from some of my bankers today watching this hearing and wanting to point out, uh, wanting to point out that difference. Um, Mr. Barr, can you talk about uh, the risks of um, interest rate, sort of this interest rate risk as it might affect um, non-banking institutions as, for example, uh, mortgage loan companies. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, first, let me just uh, you know say, as, as you indicated, I, I hear from community bankers as well, and I know many other senators have in, in, in your home states, the, the vibrancy and the health of that community banking sector, and, and, and we see that too. Um, we, we are obviously looking at interest rate risk um, as it affects not only banks, but, but also the non-bank sector. Uh, we, we look at, uh, uh, of course, at non-bank mortgage servicers, that we're looking at, at hedge funds, we're looking broadly across uh, the financial landscape to see where those risks uh, might arise and, and how those might uh, propagate in, in other ways into the banking system. So we're highly attuned to that. But again, I, I think the basic point is that the, the banking system is sound and resilient, depositors are safe, um, and, and we've, uh, through our actions, demonstrated that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Smith, Senator Lummis of Wyoming is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, panel. Um, I want to follow up a little bit on Senator Kennedy's line of questioning. As I read um, Statute 5365, Section C, Risks to Financial Stability, Safety, and Soundness, the Board of Governors may order or rule Excuse me. The Board of Governors may, by order or rule promulgated pursuant to Section 553, apply any prudential standard established under this section to any bank holding company with consolidated assets equal to or greater than $100 billion. So that was Silicon Valley Bank. Then you've got Section uh, Statute 2155 that when it was changed from May to Shell, made mandatory a new duty on the Federal Reserve to take into account higher risk profiles presented by certain banks and to strengthen supervision of those banks. So you look at Silicon Valley Bank. They had a number of activities with above average risk profiles. Uh, their concentration of deposits uh, the quantity of uninsured deposits, 94% uninsured deposits. Then you look at Federal Reserve Authority under Regulation Double Y to impose additional risk base or leverage capital or liquidity requirements or other requirements the board deems necessary to carry out the purposes of Dodd-Frank. I look at all this and I think that among all these statutes and regulations, the Fed had plenty of authority to prevent Silicon, National, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and, and the problems it encountered and, and were, was aware pretty early on that there were unique problems there and that it was a very, very unique financial institution because of its risk profile, but didn't do it. I'm, I, as I look at what authority you've been given. I can't think of another additional rule or regulation or law that you needed. Tell me whether you agree with that or not. Senator, I, I, I agree that the Federal Reserve has substantial discretion to alter through notice and comment rulemaking the rules that were put in place uh, in 2019. Um, with respect to firms uh, over $100 billion. There, there are some areas that the statute would um, provide some limitation to, but there is substantial discretion uh, for the Federal Reserve to change its rules um, for firms in the 100 to $250 billion range. Change its rules. What would it have to do? Uh, we would have to go through a notice and comment rulemaking process. Oh, I don't mean the procedure for changing oh. a rule. I mean, what changes would you make to the rule? Uh, Senator, we haven't uh, made a definitive conclusion on that. We're undertaking this review of SBV's failure in order to better assess uh, whether it would be appropriate to change capital rules and liquidity rules for this size firm, for firms more generally. Uh, we're looking at that uh, uh, right now. Is fractional reserve banking overly risky in this age of online banking? Uh, Senator, uh, let, me, let me just say, uh, repeat what I said uh, before, uh, which is that the, overall the, the safety and soundness of the banking system is strong. Uh, banks are safe and sound. Depositors should feel assured that their deposits are safe. Well, here's the it, problem, though. As I see it, the way that uh, these banks have been managed, 
Wyoming's community banks may end up paying for this through higher assessments from the FDIC. Am I correct, Mr. Grunberg? Well, as I indicated, uh, Senator, in regard to these two institutions, um, any cost to the deposit insurance fund from covering uninsured deposits is required by law to be recovered through an assessment on the banking industry. Exactly. But if I make just one additional point, the, the law does give the FDIC authority in implementing that assessment to consider the types of entities that benefit from any action taken or assistance provided. So are you saying that you're able to exempt Wyoming's community banks from paying for this? I'm suggesting we have some discretion there and we're gonna um, consider that Will, issue carefully. Will you exempt community banks from having to pay for this? That's a judgment our board is going to have to make. And as I indicated, we anticipate going out for notice and comment, uh, public rulemaking in May to implement the assessment. And as I indicated, we have discretion Do here. Do you have under to go law. through APA rulemaking to assess? That's the law. That was a that's a legal requirement. Dosh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Lummis. Senator Warren of Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we just experienced the second and third largest bank failures in American history. Executives at SVB and Signature took wild risks and must be held accountable for exploding their banks. And I'll soon introduce a bipartisan bill to do exactly that. But let's be clear, these collapses also represent a massive failure in supervision over our nation's banks. So coming out of the 2008 crisis, Congress put tough banking rules in place. Now, big banks hated them, and their CEOs lobbied hard to weaken those rules. Ultimately, Congress signed off, and then it got bad, really bad. Regulators burned down dozens of safeguards that were meant to stop banks from making risky bets. Now, the three of you here today represent the U.S. Treasury and two of our top banking regulators. I'd like to know if you believe that we need to strengthen our banking rules going forward to ensure the safety of our financial system. Vice Chair Barr, let me start with you. Do you believe we should strengthen our financial rules going forward? Yes, I do, Senator. Thank you. Vice Presi uh, President Biden agrees with you as well. Two weeks ago, he stated that we must, quote, strengthen the rules for banks to make it less likely that this kind of bank failure would happen again. Chairman Gruenberg, what about you? Do you agree with President Biden that we need to strengthen our banking rules? Uh, I do agree, Senator. Good. And now, Under Secretary Liang, do you agree with the President on this? Senator, I agree that we do need to prevent these types of bank failures. Well, I'm asking and, you, of course we need to prevent them, but, supervision but that's not by simply wishing it. It's by stronger regulation, is that right? I agree, Senator. Okay, good. Now, we need better laws here in Congress, but let's also talk about how we can strengthen the rules today, even before Congress acts. Under current law, the Federal Reserve has the discretion to apply stronger prudential standards on banks with assets between $100 billion and $250 billion, exactly the size of Silicon Valley Bank. That authority is not being used right now. Vice Chair Barr, will you use your authority to strengthen rules for the largest banks in this country as you use your authority to strengthen the rules for the largest banks in this country, will you be reaching banks with assets of at least a hundred million dollars, a hundred billion dollars? Uh, Senator, we of course would need to go through a notice and comment rulemaking um, in this process, but I anticipate the need to strengthen capital and liquidity standards for firms over $100 billion. Okay, so this is the area we're looking at. We're gonna push down further in terms of the uh, greater scrutiny. Chairman Gruenberg, let me turn to you. Once the Fed began torching rule after rule in 2018 for big banks, 
the FDIC under your predecessor joined in on the fun and also started weakening FDIC rules across the board. Capital and liquidity uh, requirements, stress tests, you name it. In fact, your predecessor explicitly told these banks that if FDIC bank examiners were asking too many questions, that they should, quote, let us know, end quote. Now, there's a banking regulator who makes it clear that she is there to serve the big banks instead of the American public. Chairman Gruenberg, will you commit to using your authority to undo the rollbacks that your predecessor initiated and to strengthen the rules and supervision for banks with greater than $100 billion in assets? Senators, I think you know I was a member of the board at that time and, and voted against those measures. And I certainly think it's appropriate for us to go back and review uh, those uh, actions in light of the recent episode uh, and, and consider what changes should well, be Well, I have to say, review sounds a little wishy here. You didn't think they were good rules to begin with. Uh, my views haven't changed, Senator. All right. So you still think they were a bad idea? I do. Got it. You know, each of you at this table has authority that you could exercise right now to strengthen rules for big banks and to ensure that our banking system and our economy are safer. I urge you to use that authority, and I urge my colleagues here in Congress to do our part to protect American families and small businesses from yet another banking crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Senator you, Mr. Warren. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, Senator Haggerty from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If you would allow me just a moment to speak to the tragedy that occurred at the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee yesterday. Um, a depraved person, a sick person, uh, executed a tragic act and uh, yielded a terrible result. And my entire community is mourning. We're mourning for the families, for the victims, for everybody concerned. I also want to acknowledge the bravery of the Nashville Police Department. Uh, they stepped into harm's way and within 14 minutes brought the situation under control. Tremendous bravery at a time when it's called for, and I want to acknowledge their sacrifices. Um, now let's turn to the matter at hand. And I know that politics in Washington always seizes upon any crisis as an opportunity to achieve whatever regulatory or legislative opportunity or goal that may be uh, in front of them. But I'd like to talk about managerial execution here. Specifically, I'd like to start with you, Chairman Grunberg. I'd like to talk through a series of events that followed SVB's failure two weeks ago. As you know, Silicon Valley Bank was taken into receivership on a Friday morning that gave the FDIC three days to find a buyer before markets opened on Sunday night. You had tremendous resources at your disposal. 18 years of experience on the FDIC board yourself. Detailed resolution plans. Over 5,000 employees and interest from a number of banks to bid, including at least one formal offer, as I understand it. Instead of successfully executing this process, however, the FDIC used the systemic risk exemption to guarantee all deposits at SVB, creating tremendous uncertainty across our economy. And now, two weeks later, the FDIC has announced the sale of less than half the bank's, failed bank's assets at a loss of $16.5 billion. So my first question, in the joint statement released on March 12th, you said, quote, no losses associated with the resolution of Silicon Valley Bank will be borne by the taxpayer. Is that still your position? Um, Senator, uh, yes, as, the, as you know. Well, the, the problem may, is, with okay. two partial sales completed and over $22 billion in losses already accrued, that position just doesn't square with reality. These losses are borne by the deposit insurance fund. That fund's going to be replenished by banks across the nation that had nothing to do with the mismanagement at Silicon Valley Bank or the failure of supervision here. In fact, that's going to be addressed by a special assessment to those banks. And as we all know, these banks will have to pass these costs along. Last time I checked, those costs that get passed along to the consumer, those consumers are American taxpayers. Chairman Grunberg, invoking the systemic risk exemption is a last resort emergency option to the typical methods of resolution. And it begs the question of why you had to invoke that extraordinary exception. Just this past Sunday's announcement of a new purchaser, part of SVB, not only were serious losses incurred, but the FDIC entered into a loss sharing agreement with the acquiring bank, and a $70 billion line of credit was extended to the purchaser. That's a pretty sweet deal. And this makes me wonder what prevented the FDIC from coming to a deal like this two weeks prior. 
You told Ranking Member Scott that you received bids for SVB over the weekend following its collapse, but that they were insufficient. What was your counteroffer? And do you, did you engage with the board of the bank that didn't approve this to get them to, to step up and approve it? We received one offer um, that um, was frankly more expensive than the cost of liquidation. Uh, it didn't appear to be a viable offer at that moment. Was there a counteroffer to that? We, I, I would have to check with our staff in terms of how much of a back and forth Let, occurred. Let's talk about the bidding process itself. Were certain banks dissuaded by you or anyone else associated with this from bidding on SVB, either before or after the bank was taken into receivership? No, Senator. Throughout the course of that weekend, I was inundated with phone calls telling me that legitimate bidders were being waved off of the process. It's one thing to reject a bid if it's bad, but if ideology had anything to do with this, this entire committee is going to be deeply concerned about that. I look forward to the GAO's report on this because the result of this failure places the banking sector in a state of disarray that we've never seen before. In spite of all the preparation and tools at your disposal, the FDIC failed to do its job. There was obviously enough demand to orchestrate a sale. What it looks like to the American people is that you simply didn't feel the incentive to execute and leaned on the systemic risk exemption to buy time, and in doing so, have placed the entire U.S. banking sector into uncharted waters. I don't see any apparent improvement in outcome. And this is a disgrace. I look forward to the GO review, and I hope that we get to the bottom of this. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, very quickly, I'd like to come to you. In response to the 2008 financial crisis, the size and scope of the regulatory regime was dramatically expanded by Congress. Regulators like yourselves are giving powers, not to mention hundreds of academics at your disposal, with the sole job of monitoring and addressing risk to the financial system. All of this was in hopes of identifying and preventing bank failures that pose systemic risk. And in spite of all these tools, we find ourselves in a situation today that uh, is, is, is unprecedented. It's pretty clear that Silicon Valley Bank was woefully mismanaged. Their management team, which didn't have a chief risk officer for eight months last year, yet created and maintained a chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, allowed their bank to accumulate truly shocking levels of risk. And while this was occurring, the San Francisco Fed was focused on researching left-wing policies that they had absolutely no expertise in ignoring one of the most basic risks in banking, interest rate risks. Perhaps most damning of all, until the day of their failure, SVB's CEO sat on the board of the San Francisco Fed. So Mr. Barr, in your review of what went wrong in your, in your supervision, will you consider the level of managerial distraction that was evident at the San Francisco Fed? Uh, Senator, the staff have uh, free reign to examine any issue that, that might have addressed supervision. I think the core issues are the ones I suggested at the outside, and they're really basic. Interest rate risk mismanagement by the bank, liquidity risk mismanagement by the bank. The, the San Francisco examiners, um, the examiners at the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank called those issues out to the board, called them out to the bank, and, and those actions were not ac acted upon in a timely way. And so I think, in, I hope you'll in a way, the issue is pretty straightforward. I hope you'll dig into the urgency, the sense of urgency that was brought to bear on this and the sense of pressure, and if every tool at their disposal was used, because they certainly were doing other things well beyond their remit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I'm going to ask the questions now, if I might. Uh, in 2008, I voted against the bailouts of the big banks because I don't support taxpayer bailouts. Uh, we do need to protect American consumers and small business folks. We need to hold bank executives accountable when they screw up. And if the regulators are asleep at the wheel, we need to hold them accountable. Look, a correlation, I would say, is when I run my farm, if I look at the price of diesel fuel and seed, and that's all I look at, I don't get the whole picture. And quite frankly, I won't be in business long. If regulators are only looking at capital, that isn't everything that's going on. At Silicon Bank, they had a concentration uh, uh, in a highly volatile industry. They had grown rapidly, had mostly uninsured deposits. Their investments were poorly timed with interest rate increases that were clearly forecasted, all setting the conditions for a classic bank run, one that happened quickly due to new technologies that are out there. So Vice Chair Barr, from 2020 to 2022, the Silicon Valley Bank grew from 20, uh, grew from 71 billion to more than 200 billion. This was a very rapid growth. It was heavily concentrated with techs and startups, industries that have always been volatile. 
Then the bank took those mostly uninsured deposits and invested them in long-term U.S. Treasuries when the Fed had been clearly forecasting that rates were going to go up, which the bank executives should have known because their CEO was a director at the San Francisco Fed. And for two years, it seems that federal regulators were flagging concerns about this situation. Is that a fair statement that for two years that the Fed was flagging concerns about this bank's financial viability? Uh, Senator, the, the examiners were focused on interest rate risk and liquidity risk at the big bank beginning in November 2021. There, at least as far as I know from the supervisory record thus far, I have, I have not seen something that said that the supervisors were focused on whether the firm was viable. Uh, but, but our review is underway. But doesn't that impact the viability? Yes, Senator, is a, a core safety and soundness risk, a, a liquidity risk and interest rate risk are core risks that the bank mismanaged. So were the regulators physically in the bank? So I've talked to a lot of intermediate-sized banks. They tell me that the regulators are right there se uh, five days a week, seven days a week if they're open, seven days a week. Were the regulators in that bank? Uh, physically speaking, I, yes. I actually don't know. The, the part of the supervisory period is during the pandemic when activities were happening I've got you. in part remote. So okay. I, I don't have yet, but we but will have. I just want to point out the fact that um, the pandemic's been over for a bit, for quite a bit, and the opportunity for those regulators to be in there would have been long before uh, a month ago. Yes, Senator, I just I don't have the full supervisory okay. record. We've just begun our review, and I want to be very careful you, to answer only questions okay. I know. Do you know if the if you know if the Fed supervisors met with the board of directors of Silicon Valley Bank? Uh, I, I don't know that yet. I know they met with senior management, but I'm still reviewing. So the you record. wouldn't know if Silicon Valley Bank had a risk committee, and if in fact the Fed uh, uh, supervisors met with the risk committee. I, I will know that by the May 1st report. So. Were they warned about potential fines? Uh, I'm sorry, could you say that again? So, I mean, look, they had some problems. Were they warned to either fix them or they were going to get fined? The matters requiring attention and matters requiring immediate attention, to my understanding, require the fixing of the problem, but I don't, I don't know uh, whether they've uh, highlighted any additional uh, steps that might be taken. Certainly, the firm was on notice that they needed to fix those problems quite clearly since November of 2021. But yet they didn't. They did not. So what point in time does the Fed regulators drop the hammer on this outfit? I mean, I don't even need to get going on the, the bank uh, CEO uh, taking uh, a ton of money right before this thing went belly up, as it was going belly up. At what point in time, we could have all the regulations on the book. I've talked to a lot of bankers who said, if this had happened before Dodd-Frank, the regulations were going to stop this to happening. And, and we have Dodd-Frank. And we did make 2155 to tailor the regulations to fit the risk. That was a big part of it on the intermediate banks. And in fact, on the small banks too. But yet, for over a year, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Barr, for over a year, Regulators were saying to this bank, straighten up and fly right, and they never did a damn thing about it. And the regulators didn't make it so damn miserable, which my understanding is regulators are pretty good at that when they want to be, make it so damn miserable that these folks would ad adjust their business plan to take care of the risks that was in their bank. Senator, I, I agree that, that the risks were there, that the regulators were pointing them out, and the bank didn't take action. It's ultimately, uh, in the first instance, the bank management responsibility to fix these problems, and they, and they failed to do it. Where, where we didn't take enough action, if the Federal Reserve supervisors didn't take enough action, we're going to be talking about that in our review, and we expect to be held accountable so, for so it. So i got to tell you, uh, uh, Michael, Michael Barr, I am not a banker. I ain't even close to being a banker. I'm a dirt farmer, and I'm going to tell you, when they laid out what this bank had happened over the last two years, you did not have to be an accountant to figure out what the hell was going on here. I agree. And all I've got to say is, as you do your uh, uh, look back into what transpired, it better be fixed.
If it's the regulator's fault, it better be fixed. If it's the regulation fault, it better be fixed. If it's something else, I hope there's a report to this committee saying, you know what, guys, this can happen again unless this happens. But it looks to me like, I'll just tell you this, and I'm looking out from the outside in, it looks to me like the regulators knew the problem, but nobody dropped the hammer. Uh, thank you, Senator Tester. As I said, our, our review is going to be uh, thorough. It's going to be open. And if we find problems like the ones that you just described, we're going to say it uh, clearly and, and describe what we think should and be done. When do you think it. that report will be done? And I'm way over time, sorry. Yes. When do you think that report uh, will be done? May 1st. May 1st. So we got a month. We should have them back after the report is done. We look forward to that. Thank Senator you. Senator Vance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and, and thanks to the three of you for being here. I want to talk just a little bit about the inherent unfairness and what I think transpired with Silicon Valley Bank. And you know, I come from the venture capital industry, and this is a statement against interests and certainly a statement against the interests of, of some of my friends. But uh, the, the business model of Silicon Valley Bank was to provide banking services to venture capital firms and to venture-backed companies. And if you think about the fundamental trade that was implied, and I would even say explicit in their business model, what they did is they offered highly beneficial financial products to venture-backed companies and venture capitalists in exchange for having a large number of deposits in your Silicon Valley bank account, sometimes often exclusively. So a common practice, for example, uh, was to say that you would provide a line of credit to a venture capital firm, but only if that firm put all of its money, 100% of its deposits, in Silicon Valley Bank. Or they would offer private jet financing and other goodies that are basically beneficial only to the very wealthy in exchange for having all of your deposits at Silicon Valley Bank. Now, given that that was implied in the business model of the bank, I think it's important that we use the term bailout, and I know that some of you don't like that term, but I think it's the only term that applies fairly here because we, using excess fees on community banks all across the country, effectively chose to bail out the uninsured depositors of Silicon Valley Bank. Now, there are some outrageous examples there. I think you know one firm had, had, had deposits over $3 billion. Another, I think Roku had deposits of $500 million. Um, but there are a lot of people a lot of firms at Silicon Valley Bank that had deposits well over a million, well over five million dollars. And what we did in practice do was, was bail them out. Uh, I, I guess my first question, I'd, I'd put this to all three of you, I mean, because time is limited, I'd, 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 like to, um, I'd, I'd like to you to answer quickly is, what is the threshold? W whether, whether you guys meant to or not, I, I think the, the, the implication of what happened with Silicon Valley Bank is that there are a lot of people who expect that their uninsured deposits are effectively insured at an unlimited level. Or if you're a banker, uh, there's an assumption from a lot of people that at a certain level, if you're systemically important enough, your uninsured depositors are going to get bailed out. Uh, maybe just go from left to right, starting with Mr. Greenberg, but at, at what level do you think uninsured deposits, in theory, are effectively unlimited uninsured in our banking system today? Well, if I may say, Senator, you're asking important questions. <clears throat> I think we have a lot of lessons to learn from this episode. Uh, the decision to cover uninsured depositors at these two institutions was a highly consequential one yes. that has implications for the system. I, I think we need, and I indicated in my statement earlier, uh, we need to do a comprehensive review of our deposit insurance system and consider the questions that you raise. The FDIC is going to undertake that, and by May 1, we'll deliver a report, including uh, policy considerations uh, to take into account. So we, we want to try to be responsive on that. Thank you. Mr. Barr. Uh, I also think you, uh, you, you raise important questions. Uh, when, when we were looking at the systemic risk determination uh, with respect to uh, these institutions, uh, we were thinking about the risk to the broader financial system, not the particular uh, depositors uh, at, at one or, or two institutions. We're thinking about and concerned about the extent to which that could impact regional banks across the country, community banks across the country. We were hearing concerns um, from bankers and from depositors, from businesses around the country. It's a difficult judgment, but one that, at the end of the day, a unanimous FDIC board and a unanimous Federal Reserve Board of the Treasury Secretary agreed that that, that risk to the system was not a risk that was uh, worth taking. Uh, and so, 
you know, today I think we can, you know, say that, that the banking system is sound and resilient, and the steps we took demonstrated that resilience and the safety of deposits around the country. So, so I, I, I'm less concerned, um, less concerned with the decision itself, though obviously I have a lot of questions there. I think there's an open question about whether we could have provided the confidence to the banking system and the liquidity that was needed in case of a bank run without bailing out the uninsured Silicon Valley bank depositors. I think that's maybe a topic for, for a follow-on hearing. But what I worry about is, is the, the, the fundamental unfairness here that we've drawn a line, and I don't know whether the line stops at Silicon Valley Bank, maybe it goes much further, maybe it stops there, where if you're systemically important, which is a term that impossible for anybody here to define with confidence, if you're systemically important, your uninsured deposits are effectively unlimited um, in their insurance, whereas if you're not systemically important, if you're a regional bank in Ohio, there's a very good chance that your uninsured depositors will not receive that bailout. And I think that uncertainty is a really, really big problem with what you guys have done. Uh, I'm not saying that in an accusatory way. I understand that there were reasons to do what you did, even though I don't think it was the right decision. I'm just saying I think it has some real moral hazard here. Uh, I, I know I'm over time here. So, so the, the one thing I'd ask here uh, is just uh, unanimous consent to introduce a, a letter to the record from American Share Insurance. Uh, this is a company that provides private deposit insurance to most state chartered credit unions, uh, including the 43 in Ohio. And just on this point of moral hazard and on this point of unfairness, what, I, what I'd, like to, I'd like you guys to consider doing is extending the same implied offer that you gave to the Silicon Valley Bank uninsured depositors to do it a little bit further down uh, the banking ladder so that everybody benefits from the rule that you guys have created for Silicon Valley Bank. Without, ob without objection. Senator. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you uh, for your service and, and testimony today. Uh, Mr. Gruenberger, um, you're aware, are you not, uh, of the fact that the CEO of SVB sold $3.6 million in company stock just 10 days before the bank collapsed and the FDIC took over its deposit. So you're aware of that, right? I am, Senator. And are you aware of the fact that other executives of the bank and employees of the bank received bonuses literally hours before SVB collapsed. Uh, yes, Senator. Now, I believe we need to have an independent uh, investigation into any criminal culpability, uh, possibility of insider trading uh, in this case, um, but regardless of any criminal culpability uh, that may be there, I think it's simply wrong, and I think almost every American would agree it's simply wrong for the CEO and top executives to profit uh, from their own mismanagement and then leave F FDIC to be holding the bag. Would you agree with that proposition that that would be wrong? Yes, Senator. Now, Dodd-Frank provides clawback authority uh, that applies to the biggest banks uh, under the Orderly Liquidation Authority, under OLA. But as I understand it, that authority does not apply to SVB Bank. Am I right about that? That is correct, Senator. Could I elaborate on that for briefly? If you could briefly. just Very briefly. We do not have explicit clawback authority. We do have an obligation to investigate any misconduct by the board and management of the institution. And we do have authorities uh, to impose consequences, including civil money penalties, restitution, and barring individuals from the business of banking. So we can get at some of the issues raised, but it's true we do not have explicit clawback authority. And they indicated earlier there would be, it would be reasonable to create parity between the Dodd-Frank Act and the Federal Deposit Insurance Act in that regard. Well, I'm glad you raised that. I heard your response earlier. And um, Senator Kennedy, a member of this committee, and I are, are working right now on bipartisan legislation to accomplish exactly what you said. I hope we can introduce it uh, this week. And I know the chairman of the committee is interested uh, as well in pursuing that. Uh, and uh, I asked uh, Secretary Yellen in another hearing last week uh, whether she and the Biden administration fully supported it. The answer was yes. Uh, so I hope we can move forward on that piece as quickly as possible, uh, because there does seem to be 
a hole in your authority. You have some authorities you indicated, but there is a hole in that authority that we have to plug, and you agree with that? I do, Senator. So, um, Vice Chair Barr, um, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, some guidance, uh, in fact, a rule uh, that was issued by your predecessor, former Vice Chair of Supervision, uh, Quarles, um, shortly before his departure uh, in March 2021. And this rule established that supervisory guidance does not have the force of law, and it cannot be used in the event where it would halt banks' abilities to conduct mergers and acquisitions and that sort of thing. Uh, I fully understand the distinction uh, between supervisory guidance and, and black letter law, but I think it's important to note that this request for this rule, um, according to the Fed's staff memo, that this guidance was issued upon industry request. Uh, and they specifically uh, note uh, the Bank Policy Institute and the American Bankers Association is submitting a petition asking for this rule to provide guidance to try to weaken the punch of the supervisory rules. Are you aware of that? Uh, yes, Senator. This goes into the frame that the chairman of the committee made earlier on, where we've got a lot of folks uh, that had been saying for months and years, let's rein in the bank supervisors, and, and now all of a sudden, it's like, where were the supervisors? Why weren't they being uh, more aggressive? Do you agree that that guidance, um, putting that into rule, uh, sent a message that you don't have to listen to supervisors' guidance that much? And uh, would you be willing to take a look at whether or not that should be repealed? Senator, I'm, I'm not sure of the impact uh, of that guidance. Uh, I think it's an appropriate area for us to be looking at. Uh, I know that staff are going to be thinking about that with respect to the SVB case, whether it mattered or it didn't matter. Uh, I do think it's an appropriate area to look at, but I do not have a firm conclusion about it. Well, I hope you'll take a look at it because uh, it was done at the behest uh, of the industry and clearly the intent was to uh, undermine the impact uh, or, or of, of the guidance provided by the regulators. Uh, so it seems to be part of a pattern of an effort to push back on regulators' authority and then come back and do the Monday morning quarterbacking and saying, where were they? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Van Hollen. Uh, Senator Daines has yielded to Senator Brett, right? Senator Brett's recognized from, from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Daines. I appreciate um, the opportunity to uh, be able to ask you all a few questions. I want to start by saying I am proud to be from the great state of Alabama where our financial institutions are strong, our regional banks, our community banks, our credit unions, and the critical role they play from our main streets to our rural roads um, could not be understated. So I am proud of the work they do and proud of the strength they continue to exhibit. Mr. Barr, I want to follow up on a question uh, that one of my colleagues brought up. You keep talking about the Fed focusing on the South of SVB and banks. However, 2155 also requires the Fed to take into consideration riskiness, complexity, financial activities, along with other risk-related factors. Tailored supervision ensures that the Fed focuses on the most risky banks. You've said repeatedly that bank mix management led to SBV's, SVB's failure. Uh, the whole point of 2155 was so that you could tailor your regs and your supervision to risk. So why did you not require definitive corrective action based on the flaws that you saw? Uh, thank you very much, Senator Britt, and I appreciate your comments about the Alabama banking uh, sector, which I think is a thriving sector and is contributing to its communities. Uh, and, and like uh, bankers across the country, is strong and vibrant. Uh, very, very, uh, you should be very proud. Thank you. We uh, are. We, we, we are um, looking at the, at the range of tailoring approaches the Federal Reserve took. Um, the decision to set those lines um, uh, by asset size and other risk factors <laughs> 
was made back in 2019. You know, I joined the board in July of 2022 and began looking at that approach. Okay. Uh, I expect to continue to review it as part of the review uh, SVB review. And, and I believe we have substantial discretion to, to alter that framework. Excellent. I, so you've talked about your review, which is ongoing. In that review, will you take a look at if you used all of the tools in your toolbox to prevent this both both before and after, will that be part of your review? Yes, Senator, the, the staff are reviewing the steps that supervisors took and whether they should have taken more aggressive action. So at current rate though, you can't speak to whether or not you utilized all of the powers that were given to you. Uh, I, I really would like to wait for the formal review for the staff to come evaluate the full supervisory record to make an assessment. Absolutely. But we're, we're certainly very focused on that question and if we didn't do the right steps, we're gonna say that. Yes. Well, I, um, I find it concerning, though, when you all were asked, each one of you were asked, would you like to see more powers, more strength in this? Every single one of you said yes, when you don't actually know if you utilize the tools in your toolbox correctly, um, or if the people that were under your supervision were supervising appropriately. I think that's what people hate about Washington. We have a crisis, and you come in here without knowing whether or not you did your job, you say you want more. That's not the way this works. You need to be held accountable each and every one of you. I'm a big believer you got to own your own space. And speaking of, Mr. Grudenberg, I want to talk about yours. So you are not the primary supervisor here. Obviously, that's the Fed. But you are the non-primary supervisor for SVB, or were. Is that correct? Yes, we have backup so supervision. You moment. have backup supervision. You had that before Dodd-Frank, correct? Yes. You had it after Dodd-Frank, correct? Yes. And 2155 did not change that responsibility that you had. That's correct. Right. So in that role, what did you do prior to the bank's failure to exercise that, that power? Yeah, in, this, in this instance, we were working with the Fed as the institution was experiencing difficulties. But I think it's fair to say that it was in a supportive role with the primary regulator. Okay, but you did raise this to the primary regulator. You did exercise that We were that working authority. with the primary regulator in regard to the institution. Excellent. I am so glad to hear that. We have to make sure that we are working together and doing our job in order to prevent these things from happening. Um, happening in the future. One of the things I also want to talk about um, is just the different responsibilities that each of you have and whether they were executed. Um, and then additionally, want to talk, we'll move into the FDIC's bank auction process for just a minute, although I only have 33 seconds left. Um, it seems that you failed to put the bank in receivership and the FDIC passed on allowing the Silicon Valley Bank to be purchased. Is that a correct assessment or do you feel like that's been an inc incorrectly um, identified throughout the news cycle? Uh, yes, uh, Senator. I, the, the bank was placed in receivership on Friday morning, and um, we in, endeavored to uh, solicit bids over the weekend. As I indicated previously, it was, a, it was a rapid failure, so there was no opportunity prior to failure to prepare for a resolution. We tried to market it. We did, yep. got two bids. Neither, neither would have been... Um, less costly than liquidation. So we then proceeded to put in place a process where we were able to bid out. Yes, and I am out of time, but I will say, and six months prior, JP Morgan noticed that there was a problem, their equity research team, and then Moody's obviously met with SVB prior to saying that they were going to downgrade. So I've heard you all say this was a rushed process. If the outside sector knew this was happening, you and the Fed and the 4,000 examinators should have known that this was coming as well. Uh, Senator Warnock of George is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, many Americans, and in fact all of us, would remember the unfairness of the 2000, of 2008 and that crisis uh, when bankers who made bad decisions, who played uh, games with our economy, uh, not only did they not go to jail, uh, they got to keep their jobs and their multi-million dollar salaries. Uh, I feel that in a particular way as someone who pastors and moves in communities where poor and marginalized people have the weight of the law come down upon them for the smallest of infractions. Not one banker went to jail, they kept their multi-million dollar salaries. When bankers made risky bets that threatened our uh, entire economy, they got to cash in. They should be held accountable. 
We discovered shortly after regulators took control of Silicon Valley Bank that top executives at the bank offloaded millions of dollars worth of stock in the weeks leading up to the collapse. Very convenient including their former CEO who sold $3.6 million worth of stock two weeks before the bank crashed. The Dodd-Frank banking reform law included a compensation clawback provision for executives identified as excessive risk takers. Or in other words, those who put their banks and the entire economy in jeopardy. Mr. Grunberg, the FTE the FDIC, in conjunction with the other financial regulators, began working on a rule to implement this provision in Dodd-Frank in 2011 and then again in 2016, but a final rule was never issued. Does the FDIC have plans to revisit this rule? It has been discussed, Senator, and it seems to me appropriate. It's appropriate and I, I would say urgent. And um, I know that the Justice Department and the SEC are looking closely into this matter. And I would encourage them to include uh, any evidence of insider trading. Uh, that seems only appropriate, uh, given the circumstances. That, that should be a part of the scope of their pro. Uh, but there is a scenario where these executives not only get away scot-free, but also with sizable paydays. And the FDIC should use every tool it has at its disposal to prevent it. We certainly don't want to incentivize this kind of behavior. So uh, again, Mr. Gruenberg, out, outside of this rule, tell me where can Congress step in to stop incentivizing this, this type of high-risk behavior? Does the FDIC need additional legal tools to hold excessive risk takers accountable? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, first, as a matter of law, whenever a bank fails, the FDIC is required to conduct an investigation of the conduct of the board and the executives of the institution. And we have authorities under the law uh, to impose accountability, including civil money penalties, restitution, and barring individuals from the business of banking. So we have significant civil authorities under the law now. It was mentioned earlier, and I think it's appropriate, that we do not have explicit clawback authority in regard to compensation. We can get at that issue through our existing authorities, but certainly providing explicit clawback authority under the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, as the FDIC has under the Dodd-Frank Act, would be, would be appropriate, in, in addition uh, to completing the rulemaking that, that you raised previously. Now, both, both of these things are important. We, we've got to complete the rulemaking and, and look at and see whatever additional tools may uh, be necessary. Certainly. As the ship is sinking, we don't want bankers to be able to move all of their products on a lifeboat. I agree, um, and so we've got to address this. I want to switch uh, to a related topic. For several days, payroll providers banking with SVB or Signature Bank had no way to access their deposits. Everyday folks, leading to many Americans receiving their paychecks late or having missing paychecks. Too many Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And in this case, they got it late. And as a result, some of the 64 million Americans living uh, paycheck to paycheck were hit with overdraft fees, non-sufficient fund fees due to the disruption, something I've addressed uh, 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 in other settings. And that's why I sent a letter with Senator Booker urging regulators to impose a temporary moratorium on overdraft and non-sufficient fund fees for folks who incurred these fees at no fault of their own. Mr. Grunberg, does the FDIC have a plan surrounding overdraft and non-sufficient fund fee protections in the event that we experience broader systemic issues? Senator, you raise an important question when you received your letter. As a starting point, we know there were delays. We really want to get the facts in terms of if overdraft fees were really imposed as a result of those delays, if we, if we can confirm that information, then we can, can consider what actions to undertake. And we're glad to work with you and your staff as we follow up on that. I, I look forward Thank to you. working with you on this. Here's the bottom line. Ordinary folks who, who just showed up, put their deposits, they, they shouldn't have to 
uh, bear the brunt and burden of, of these bad decisions made by bank executives. Thanks, Senator Warnock. Uh, Senator Daines from Montana is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and the general turmoil in the banking sector are the direct result of the failures of regulators, including the agencies we have before us today, also the executive teams, these financial institutions, and the inflationary environment sparked in no small part by the Biden administration's reckless spending. I remember having debates right here with the banking committee about these massive stimulus bills, that $1.9 trillion spending bill that even Lawrence Summers said was inflationary on a purely partisan vote it passed with Democrats supporting and Republicans opposing. But each of these groups, back to Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, failed to prioritize properly clear and present risks of the inflationary environment, rising interest rates, what well, it did to bond values, instead opting to focus on climate change, equity, and other factors that did not contribute in any way to the crisis we have before us. I raised these issues of misaligned priorities with Secretary Yellen during a Finance Committee hearing back in June of 21, when she identified climate change, non-bank financial intermediation, and Treasury market resilience as the key priorities for FSOC. Now, we're facing a situation where responsible banks in my home state of Montana and elsewhere will be on the hook for providing tens of billions of dollars and potentially more to bail out irresponsible coastal banks for risk taking that regulators failed to act upon despite first noticing as far back as 2019. Turning to my question, Vice Chair Barr, you state in your testimony that your review is, quote, focusing on whether the Federal Reserve supervision was appropriate for the rapid growth and vulnerabilities of the bank, end quote. The question is, if you find as part of your review that certain individuals were clearly negligent in the performance of their duties, are you willing to recommend they be fired? Uh, Senator, I don't want to prejudge in any way the review. I'm, I'm going to get that evidence back. I'm going to understand it fully. And I, I said, but if part of your review you find they're negligent, would you recommend they be fired? I, I, it's hard for me to answer in the abstract, sir. I, I, I believe we'll, we'll take appropriate action with respect to the supervisory structure as a whole, whether with respect but would you, to Are you willing to, is termination one of the options? I, I don't I, know. That's an easy question. I just said an option. I'm not saying you have to exercise. Is that an option? Can some, will some, could somebody be fired for this? Um, I, I would have to understand the, the basis in our human resources law. The and bank I wanna, executives I lost their jobs, as should some of these regulators. Shouldn't that be the case if they're asleep at the wheel? Uh, Senator, I, I want to be very careful. There, there are laws and procedures with respect to uh, how you but treat you, employees. You can make a recommendation to HR, and they can tell you whether or not that's allowed or not. I've, I've been in the corporate world for most of my career. I've worked at HR, as is true within the federal government. You can make a recommendation if somebody is asleep at the wheel and negligent. I, I would be happy to follow up with you, Senator. I, I promise we will take appropriate action uh, based on the review, but I, I don't have a, a definitive answer for you at this moment. I do find it ridiculous that you're unwilling to say that if people fail to perform the responsibilities that you might recommend they be fired. Uh, Vice Chair Barr, did you visit the San Francisco Fed in October of last year? October last year? What, what year? I mean, in, in 2022. Uh, uh, I don't believe so. Okay, well, the, the San Francisco Fed published a supervision and brief memo stating the top priorities that you outlined with that visit aligned with their top priorities. It may be that I did a, a virtual seminar for a range of supervisors, and so there, the San Francisco Fed folks were in attendance for that, but I, I don't believe I was in San Francisco. So, so the regulator's perspective that came out from the 12th District, the San Francisco Fed, said they were aligned with what was top of mind for the work being done in the 12th District. The first thing it says is financial risks from climate change. This is at a time back in October 22 when you saw that discount rate was always up to 3%. We were seeing those three quarter point increases coming out of the Federal Reserve over and over and, tar and they were communicating that it was gonna probably continue. Um, and that was about the time that also the Richmond Fed in the fifth district, they had a little different view in terms of prioritizing risks and they thought perhaps a rising rate environment might be 
the highest risk in terms of priority to look at versus San Francisco Fed says it's about climate change was their number one priority listed stacked ranked the three that they, that they placed out. It's clear in hindsight that the Richmond Fed was focused on the clear and present risks of rising interest rates while the San Francisco Fed was not. My question is, since you were confirmed in July, what percentage of your time have you spent focusing on climate policy and financial inclusion versus how the Federal Reserve's monetary policy might impact banks like Silicon Valley? Be as brief as you can in that answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator, I've, I've been focused on risk throughout the system, both short-term and long-term risks. And interest rate risk is a bread and butter issue in banking. It's what our supervisors do all the time. Thank That's you, what Senator. the San Francisco Thank Fed said it was climate change risk. And by the way, uh, Senator Sinema is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today. You know, today's hearing is about trust, whose trust has been broken, who broke that trust, and how all of us work together to reaffirm and rebuild that trust. Trust is a key principle that the modern banking system is built on. Families trust that their hard-earned savings are safe in the U.S. banking system. Congress entrusts our federal banking regulators with the power to supervise, regulate and examine banks. We trust you to be the cops on the beat and have given you the tools to do that job. The failure of Silicon Valley Bank on the Federal Reserve's watch very clearly calls into question whether or not some of that trust was misplaced. Make no mistake, the lion's share of the blame is on incompetent bank executives. And it's outrageous that these people took bonuses and sold stock in the days leading up to the bank's failure. We should hold these executives accountable for the fullest extent of the law and claw back those bonuses and stock sales. I'm co-sponsoring a bill to do just that. But as I laid out in a letter to you, Vice Chair Barr, that, by the way, was signed by 11 other senators spanning the ideological spectrum, it's gravely concerning that retail participants, literally just regular everyday people, were able to figure out that something was wrong with Silicon Valley Bank before your regulators took appropriate action. Now, these folks don't have access to non-public information like the bank examiners do, but when people on Reddit and Twitter can spot bank mismanagement before the regulators, something is terribly wrong. So my questions today are for you, Vice Chair Barr. I have lots of questions, so I'd like concise answers, and we'll follow up in writing. You were sworn in as Vice Chair for Supervision on July 19th, 2022. Your testimony indicates that due to ongoing review, you'll focus on what you know. So let's start there. The Fed knew of problems at the bank dating back to 2019. Were you personally made aware of major deficiencies at Silicon Valley Bank prior to the collapse? And if so, which ones and when were you notified? Uh, thank you, Senator. The, the staff made a presentation uh, to the board, uh, the Gov board of Governors in the middle of February uh, of this year that was focused on interest rate risk uh, broadly in the banking system and how banks and managers um, and supervisors were addressing those risks. And as part of that presentation, the staff highlighted uh, the interest rate risk uh, that uh, was uh, present at Silicon Valley Bank and indicated that they were in the middle of a further review and expected to be uh, basically coming back to the bank shortly with uh, further, uh, further information about their status. I believe that is the first time that I was told about uh, interest rate risk uh, at Silicon Valley Bank. So you were first notified shortly, um, shortly after folks on your staff learned about these deficiencies? Uh, Senator, the, the uh, supervisors began uh, highlighting these deficiencies at the firm in interest rate risk management and liquidity risk management uh, in, in, a, in a, a serious way in November of 2021, as far as I know, so about a little bit more than a year prior to that. They intensified that supervisory uh, review as part of its uh, uh, full scope exam in the summer of 2022 when the firm was downgraded for deficiencies in its risk management practices. And they brought those issues again, uh, according to the record, to the, to the CFO of the firm in October and issued additional uh, findings in November of 2022. Uh, so that, that, as far as we know from the current supervisory record, is, is the picture. 
And that's when you, so you were first notified in October and November of 2022? Uh, no, Senator. To the best of my knowledge, I first learned about the issues at Silicon Valley Bank with respect to interest rate risk uh, in fe mid-February of 2023. So several weeks before the bank failed, uh, staff made a presentation to the board about interest rate risk broadly and with a particular uh, f a highlight, if you will, uh, on Silicon Valley Bank. Mm. and indicated that they were following up with the bank with further measures. So your testimony says that asset size is not necessarily an indicator of complexity, and I agree, which is why Section 401 of S2155 gives the Fed explicit authority to impose the regulations and enhance supervision normally reserved for the largest institutions. And you can do that on any bank between 100 and 250 billion in assets, like SVB. The Fed is given this authority to prevent or mitigate risks to the financial stability of the U.S. We both agree that this is existing authority that the Fed has had since the enactment of S-2155 in 2018, correct? Yes, the, the Fed has broad authority uh, to change the rules it uses for uh, different approaches to, uh, to supervision of firms. Under the rules that were put in place in 2019, the firm was bucketed by a set of categories. Uh, I think that it is important to revisit those, as I have been doing since arriving at, at the Federal Reserve in July. So given the documented issues that... You're over time, we'll wrap up if you can, one more This question. will be my last question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So given the documented issues that your supervisors found with the SVB that we just kind of went over, did the Fed ever consider using its existing Section 401 authority before the failure to more aggressively regulate the bank? Uh, based on the current supervisory record, it looked like the escalations that had occurred were in the format of MRAs and, and sorry, matters requiring attention and matters requiring uh, immediate attention. And the supervisors also put in place what's called a 4M agreement, which is uh, a limitation on the firm's ability to engage in uh, merger transactions with financial companies. Thank you, Senator, Thank you. Senator, Senator, uh, Senator Tillis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here. Um, I, I want to start maybe with a question that uh, uh, I think Vice Chair Barr, you answered Senator Warren saying that you thought banks over $100 billion uh, should have additional prudential requirements. Did I hear that correctly? I, I think it's important for us to strengthen capital and liquidity requirements for large banks um, really up, uh, up the spectrum. Is there any of the tools, you know, just going back, at, at, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like, uh, without objection, to submit this to the record. This is the regulatory regimen that applies to uh, banks of certain categories. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, I always worry about when we create an arbitrary asset limit for doing something, because it was the activities of Silicon Valley that got them in trouble. Um, and so I'm... I, I just want to ask briefly, I got a lot of questions and I will get them done on time. Uh, you've mentioned a couple of times, uh, Vice Chair Barr, that the 2019, um, I guess, implementation of Senate Bill 2155, I'm inferring that, uh, bucket at Silicon Valley in, in a certain regulatory regimen. Did that mean that it restricted it from having supervisors make the judgment that the additional, that the the increased uh, prudential regulations or, or supervisory functions could not occur? Um, uh, Senator, we're, we're bound by the rules we put out. So if yeah. we want okay. a, a so new what, framework, we in, need in to In 2019, change. different administration predates your tenure. Uh, are, are you saying that 20, the promulgation and the implementation of 2155 took certain supervisory or regulatory regimens off the table for Silicon Valley Bank? Uh, the Federal Reserve's implementation in 2019 yeah. set basically the standard for how that would that yeah. firm would apply. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that regulators, supervisors do have judgment. Um, that's and that's they my can, point. Can put in place that's mitigating my point, matters. Because when I hear bucketing, I think about ring fencing, and I wonder if that meant that a supervisor, that in my in my opinion, if you take a look at the matters requiring immediate attention and then or attention and immediate attention. Um, do you know yet, I know we'll get the report in May, but do you know yet how many of those MRAs were followed by an MRI? In other words, the six that were issued uh, 
over the course of a year and a half or two years, how many of them was an escalation of the matter requiring attention to immediate attention, if any? And if you don't know that, you can submit it actually, if you will, just submit it for the record. Look, I, we've got a CEO of Silicon Valley Bank that is a Class A member of the board of the San Francisco Federal Reserve who got summarily terminated on the day of the bank's collapse. Um, uh, in your review, will we also have insight into California's role in regulating this bank, or will this be purely federal jurisdiction? We're looking uh, o only at the Federal Reserve. Yeah. The state of California is initiating its yeah. own review. Well, I think that's going to be very helpful because, in my opinion, I agree uh, with uh, uh, former Fed uh, Torillo that he sees this as a regulatory lapse. Torillo was never complimentary of Senate Bill 2155. He was implementing Dodd-Frank when we were doing it. He was hammering it. He's made the statement, and Mr. Chair, I'd also like to submit for the record a, an article interview with uh, Mr. Torillo um, from uh, Marketplace that he specifically says in here, you know, 2155 is likely or impossible to be a root cause of the problem. I'm paraphrasing. He was saying it looks like a regulatory and supervisory lapse. And I think we're going to find that that lapse it, it, it is not only with the Fed, but more likely even the supervision that the uh, state of California Without objection, so ordered. was involved in. Um, so I, I'm also kind of curious in the report, are we going to see any movement? Uh, and I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there, there is one question of, did we have a level of comfort with this bank among some of the supervisors. Do we know or have any insight over the past few years if anybody who had worked for the Fed works for this bank? We know that the CEO was on the Fed board, but are on a board at the Fed. Uh, uh, Senator, just with respect to the Class A directors uh, uh, that you mentioned, Class A directors are prohibited from participating in any way in, in supervision. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I get that. But, but, but it's just People in proximity, maybe people call them balls and strikes. Uh, the supervisors didn't get that uh, quite right. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think that there are some people who, and I, I want to find the root cause of the problem. And I think that you all will find a lot of information when you issue your report. I, I don't think that we're doing the banking industry any service going forward if we talk about now we just got to rein in the small banks. We've got to increase by default, regardless of the activities of the bank. Uh, we've got to increase by default uh, their uh, prudential requirements and, uh, and with your holistic review, capital requirements, a number of other things. If, when you have a run on a bank like you did with Silicon Valley, could any bank possibly have enough to cover the run? Any bank. Uh, you know, Senator, the, the particular bank in question is quite unique in its in its structure, its liability approach, and its and its interest rate risk management. Uh, I can just speak to that particular bank. That, that well, particular that, bank had. I mean. If you look at that their bank, if you looked at their internal liquidity stress testing, if you took a look at their contracts on uh, an interest rate exposure, this does not take a highly sophisticated person to understand the risk, and it damn sure had to be known months before the, the uh, chickens came home to roost. And I wish that we could just focus on that problem um, and not use the red herring of some lapse in regulatory oversight that was the root cause of this bank collapse. It simply was not, and I'd love to find anybody to prove it wrong. I don't care how you feel about regulatory tailoring, but use a valid argument to fight against it. Do not use Silicon Valley Bank as an example, I'm not suggesting that you have. But there are many people that sit up here who have at the expense of looking at how we can prevent this in the future. And I do have questions for the record that I'll submit. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Senator Tills. Thanks all of the three of you for your testimony, your public service. Uh, I look forward to the reviews on these bank failures. And thank you for, for helping s start that process. It's interesting. Many of my Republican colleagues are now so eager for bank regulators to crack down on banks for taking uh, on too many risks. I hope they remember that when it comes time to empower regulators and strengthen guardrails, including protecting the independent funding of financial regulators. The events of last month have shown why we need independent regulators funding and stability for all of our financial watchdogs. But now as the Supreme Court considers whether the CFPB's independent funding is, cons funding is constitutional, these independent watchdogs 
dialogue's ability to keep our financial system stable faces an ex existential threat. U.S. financial regulators, as we know, are independently funded so they can quickly respond when crises happen. On this and every issue, I'll continue to fight to, to protect American workers from Wall Street arrogance and greed. Uh, thank you for joining us. The meeting's adjourned.